Plot, The Eyes of Me, 2009. Action, Adam, written by Anonymous. An up-close look at four teens who have lost their sight. Set in Austin, TX. This film follows their high school experiences of dating, academic responsibilities, fitting in, family problems and preparing for college over the course of one dynamic year. Voice over off. When you're blind and watching movies, what will you find? A blind superhero whose superpowers are acting like he's not blind. A sighted actor over dramatically touching people's faces. And maybe the whole joke is that they're bumping in to different places. A spectacular, macular. Hello. Hi. And welcome to Citizen White Cane. Um, this is the podcast that is also a non accredited film school for the blind. Um, I'm your professor, Sky McLeod. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, I'm your willing student, Melissa Buckta. Oh, you? I, I think you're also going to be at least a professor, if not a lecturer. <laughs> oh, I think def- you could be a lecturer if you want, but Maybe. you should be at least part of the teaching staff. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, I can be <laughs> I can be your adjunct professor then. Okay. I okay. only took one film class in college. So, well, well, I, well actually, I took three. Three, if you there can. you go. Maybe maybe there's. A I mean, we're more. non-accredited, so it's fine. They're cool. Well, I didn't get a degree. I just took all the classes for it. Thought cool. Then I will be. I will be a professor too. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank Cla- you. Classes in session. <laughs> um. Yeah. And we are talking about movies today. Though today we're talking about. Um. Also, I picked that because it was. Uh. We're talking about a movie that's a documentary that is also about a school for the blind. Yes. Uh, we saw The Eyes of Me this week. It was yes. your pick. Yes. This is going to be a very interesting conversation because we're not talking about characters yeah. that someone has written or enacted. We're talking about real human beings. So we'll see. We're like really trying to play with the form early on just to test the water, see if this is interesting or not. <laughs> no, I, I, I enjoy documentaries. and Well, in general, but I, I think it's a good idea to talk about documentaries that involve blind people yeah because it's it is being seen it, it, it that's you know you, you feel that's how I felt when I was watching it is I oh I get I understand the struggles that these kids are going through because I mm. went through similar situations yeah definitely and I think also like the when we talk about representation and stuff and with fictional things there is it's rarely written by blind people so you kind of have that there's so much lost in translation whereas here though there's you know a film crew and an editor so that really does shape it and if that's a sighted person that's going to shape it in a lot of ways but you're still at least having a lot more like just actual blind people from like it's coming from a place of reality obviously it's a documentary but like you know that there is there's a less of the hand of god of like filmmaking that can like completely rewrite the experience of blindness fun yes fun fact the director of this documentary went on to direct the documentary tower oh i've not seen what is that oh it's so good so tower talks about the incident that happened at a texas university when a sniper went up to the top of the clock tower and basically just opened fire oh on, on the campus. It's it's horrible. But I don't think I can watch that. It's a really well I done documentary. I saw Elephant by Gus Van Zandt and I'm like, I can't, that's it, I can't do it. Well, that, yeah, yeah. It's a, that's fictional, but. But yeah. if you're, if, if, uh, if you want to, the to- uh, tower is an amazing documentary. It's not easy to watch, but it's, it's amazing. And I, I, it makes sense because this documentary also imply, uh, uses rotoscope. Which, oh, yeah. yeah, which is what uh, a lot of the tower is filmed in, is is rotoscope. All the oh, reenactments are done in rotoscope. Yeah. That's, I guess, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. I, reenactments are such an odd, like, part of documentary filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's an interesting take to have it being rotos- rotoscoped, um, like, because you're kind of like, it, it has that, like, 
they're always a little bit of an uncanny valley, but it also, like, reenactments are their own kind of uncanny valley, so it right. kind of, like, makes sense. And I think the rotoscope works in that it kind of separates the, the reenactments from the story. Yeah. But it's not, it's definitely not used, because uh, the reenactments are, are not uh, a fictional thing. I mean, these are things that happened from the people coming from the people who lived them right so the road i don't feel like the rotoscope separates you from yeah that. it it heightens everything but right. it doesn't separate this this film the rotoscoping was really cool or this documentary i should say the rotoscoping was really cool in that it was used to illustrate blindness and yeah. better can is was a better way to show what these characters see rather than trying some stupid special effect or in camera trick or something. Right. So I think the use of rotoscope was used yeah. well. It was it was really interesting. It's interesting. I like that we've now had a decent amount of movies that have attempted to show the perspective of blind people. We've had like and they've also we've had a, f- a handful of ways like that they go about doing that. Um, and I thought this one made a lot of sense because you can like. Yeah, you can kind of, what they do is though, a lot of times it's when someone's describing what they see, but it's not always. Like, but there was a, a few times where people were saying, like, this is how the world looks to me. And so then the the kind of rotoscoping animation would change and kind of portray that. Yeah, I mean, it would it would go black for someone that their eyes completely black out or it would go into fuzzy shapes and colors. Um grayscale colors for someone who only saw she said she it was like looking through a fog right she just saw vague shapes and outlines right it's definitely it's interesting um because it is it is a formalistic challenge that i think like um it's yeah it's very fascinating to see how different filmmakers um do that differently and it is a it's I think PBS originally. It is. Yeah. It was released on PBS through Independent Lens. Ooh. And Illegal Films was one of the production companies, which I thought was a funny name. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so it is pretty, like, low budget. Um, oh, yeah. You can – I you could definitely tell that uh, this – I believe this was his first doc, like his okay. first feature film, and it feels like it. It's not yeah. bad. It's definitely not bad, but you can. It's it feels like an independent definitely. doc. Uh, also, there is audio description permanently embedded yeah, in the film. Yeah, I was gonna say, and it's and it is badly. It is permanently, so terrible. It's it, very frustrating. I. Oh man, I started this with a real sour taste in my mouth because I'm like the mixing. The mix is, is so horrendously bad. The mix bad. is so bad. That was gonna be my number. I was like, should I say so early on that the mix is so no, bad? No, the mixing is like, terrible. Yes, um, there, there are points where I don't know if the mics were getting feedback or what the heck yeah, happened, but like, there would be double doubling, doubling the audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not I was and, trying to figure out what. And I was like, what the problem was? Is that just a choice? But I, I honestly don't think it was. I don't think it was. No, because I had the exact same thought. And it was just like, it didn't. Because like the first time you hear it, it's like one of the people that were following, um, Chaz, who's like a part of his thing is that he is a rapper and like records songs. And I think it was like during one of his songs that it, that I, that I think it did it the right. first time. But that, that is the only time it made sense. Cause I'm like, okay, well, yeah, he's got but, a microphone. The camera has a microphone. Maybe we're just getting feedback or he's looping it. Right. Or right. Or he's looping it. it. Right. Which is why I was like, okay, so maybe that's a stylistic thing or it's like something going on. But then it would happen at the like other very weird the, places that the did not times. have any yeah. sort of, that it didn't make any sense. Can I, cause I was like, is this about like an accessibility? device that's like doing a weird thing but that didn't even make sense either because you would have like you know people were just like talking to Mm -hmm. each other and then all of a sudden it would just like for half a sentence be like tripled right and And then like a weird (laughs) echo and then the and then the audio description comes in and then jazz goes to high i'm just like okay okay you you know what (laughs) here let's demonstrate i'll be i'll be the blind person you be the audio description i'll be like someone in the documentary talking okay so i am a rapper and i make songs this is the song that i make la 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 yeah that's what it sounds literally terrible it's i 
I almost wish it wasn't there. <laughs> I'm well, just like, it, I would rather have it not be there than be bad. <laughs> yeah, it's really like, and it, because it, they waited until, I mean, mostly they waited until people weren't talking, but like the music was so loud and the music was too loud in the mix. Yes, the music was way too loud. The only good thing about the audio description is when you could hear it, the, it would read you signs and all of the text that appeared in the film. Right. There's not a huge amount of text, but there is a fair amount of text that I would have had trouble reading had it not been for well, the audio the very description. And they do the documentary thing. This is, you know, what happened since right, the filming. Right. And like, there's one of them I couldn't really hear at it's all. Isaacs. And, yeah, Isaacs. Yes, exactly. They just yes, like, yes. Yeah. It's so sad. And it just soft. peters out. Yeah. 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 That you yeah. can't actually. So I don't know what ever happened to Isaac. <laughs> no, I. Um, you kind of sort of gather it from context. context. But I, yeah. I, do we want to get into the actual like people in the movie or like sure so our like the like our handy handy dandy voiceover said the documentary follows four high schoolers um two who are seniors or maybe three i'm not sure if isaac is a senior or not no two who are seniors and two who are um either sophomore or junior it's really not stated i think yeah i'm not sure yeah it's fall it follows four kids isaac chaz denise and megan and they all attend the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. In Austin, right? Yes. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Oh, no, wait. Is it Austin or Dallas? I think it's Austin. I think it's Dallas. Okay. Okay, I mean, we'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we get to see each of their... Well, home life to some extent, though they it's like a boarding school, so a right. lot of people do actually live there. Chaz is the one that doesn't, um, yeah, but she, he lives in an apartment with a with a roommate with a roommate. Yeah, at the beginning of the film, right? I mean, these kids, it's it's really interesting because these kids definitely do not have uh, they they're not perfect. Yeah, I mean, obviously nobody is perfect, but these kids, you get to see just all of the intimate details of their lives well they're like just kind of also teenagers <laughs> oh yeah so they're going they're through imperfect everything perfect in the way that mm -hmm. all teenagers are mm -hmm. imperfect mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i think that that's it is i mean i it's fascinating because it is something that like i just my experience is so far from getting to do something like that i was so cut off from any other blind people me too so it yeah. is like amazing to think but then there's also a question of i wonder how the education is different for them because like they didn't like you know because i don't have a lot of faith in this country and so hopefully it was a good education but you do wonder sometimes i think when you have like a school that's made for certain disabilities there's the the bar is set lower because of that and, and you, but I, you don't know you can't really I tell definitely don't think that it looked like a really nice school and it looked like they were getting a a decent education. I I really don't think. Well, that did we see them? This was a terrible school. It didn't look terrible. No, no, one, it definitely didn't. Know. I mean, I don't know if we saw really the. We didn't actually get to see a class though. Like we didn't see you them really see, do we any. Saw, well, you you saw parts of classes with Megan especially, and then you saw the, uh, the student council meeting. You saw a bit of that, right. and but that doesn't necessarily like that's kind of neutral. I don't think yeah. like nothing in the film made it seem like it was a bad school at all. Uh, but I don't. I don't think anything really spoke to the quality of the education. Right, but I don't think you can just assume that all schools for disabled people are just lower. No, like, no, I, I, know, I don't. I don't assume that. I, I wish I knew more about the if that was true. Like I just like there that is a concern that I have because I think that it is an important thing to balance out. Because, I mean, like, because, you know, there is an argument of, like, segregation and, like, and I think segregation, just like with race and ability, like, you just are like, well, it's blind people, so we can expect less of them. You know, and they have all sighted teachers, so, like, we didn't see any blind teachers. So the, so the kind of advocacy is, we don't, there's no guarantee that there's advocacy for the, like, quality of education for the students, like, and and but this is like I want to be clear I don't know but I wish right, that there was right. more of a sense of like it because you really there was very little um, footage which I guess makes sense like because you know you don't need to hear a lecture well, on like was, World War Two or you know like no, that's not helpful this, to the movie. This documentary, <laughs> yeah, no, this documentary was a focusing on the kids, not the school. If it was a documentary about the school, 
I think it would be a lot different. Yeah. But this is that's not the story that this that the filmmaker wanted to tell. He wanted to tell the story of these four kids. Yeah, yeah. It was something that I that was definitely on my mind throughout the whole mm-hmm. film. And so that's that's kind of why I think I'm saying it right now. But it definitely but yeah. it definitely does bring up your experience, especially if you're a blind person watching this film, which we both were or are. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking about what my ed- you know, comparing my education to this. I didn't go to a special school. The only special school I, I remember going to was preschool. I did go to a special needs preschool. Oh, wow. But after that, I went to just regular, good old, sighted, able school. Yeah. And I don't, I don't necessarily think it was a detriment, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it was easy or fun. No. Or, it was hell. Yeah, it was I, pretty especially, Yeah, especially when you hit middle school and high school. Yeah. And the work becomes impossible because you're just like, you just don't have the ability to do the work and no one has the ability to accommodate you enough. Or, well, that was my experience. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Um, For me, it wasn't necessarily about the work, unless it was math, but that's a whole nother story. But no, for me, it wasn't necessarily about the work. It was the people Mm -hmm. and it it wasn't the teachers. It it literally was the other kids. I, when there were only three or four of us blind people. Yeah, the same in, in, my, in my high school. Yeah, and I don't, and I, none in my middle school. I think I was the only person with a cane. I know, actually, I know I was the only person with a cane because my middle school was tiny. But oh, yeah, my high school is tiny, and I didn't go to middle school, so mm-hmm. that's yeah. But but yeah, so being the only blind person, or or being one of like three, mm-hmm. which is and the you, experiences. Mm-hmm. And in the film, you get to see kind of you do get to see both sides of the coin. There's the blind school where everybody is blind, visually impaired and learning. And yeah. then and you feel you don't feel ostracized. You feel like a person. You are a part right. of this community. And then some of the other students, two of them, um, one by choice and one not so by choice, end up going to a regular high school, a, yeah. a quote Does unquote one, abled high or school. Or did one, isn't it that one went to like the Isaac who gets kicked out yes. has to go to a yes, regular sir. high school because mm-hmm. he has to. But yes. then the other one is, Take, who, isn't it that? It's Megan. Megan, and she's, but she had like before had been, right? Like it yeah, was that she, she went to the blind school after being in a normal high well, school? Well, she was, right? she went to the blind school and then she went to the normal school to take supplemental classes. Oh, so she chose to. Yeah. So she chose to do that. And but you do get to see with Isaac, especially when he has to go to to regular school, you get to see how absolutely ostracized someone like him is. That was definitely the most poignant. Yeah. Because he even says, you know, I'm I'm the only person at my school with a cane. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And he's just like sitting alone. Right. Right. I mean, I was one of three or four people in my high school with a cane. And then when I went to the U, I was one of me. (laughs) That's it. I was the only person in the, in the entire university to use a cane. Oh so everybody gosh. everybody knew who I was. Wow. Because I I was the I was the girl with the cane and I didn't start using my a cane until middle school. Right. And I didn't I have no experience of being in school and having a cane. So it's great and it sucks all at the same time. I can it's see that because that's not having a cane is the same way because people don't ever know what's going on with you and they always treat you differently and you the amount of times during school like and I I mean I wasn't diagnosed till I was 15 so I didn't even get to do this until like halfway through high school but like I had to explain so much and it was it's just exhausting because you spend so much of your life being like so I'm blind and when I say I'm blind I'm like not being it's not a figure of speech I'm not like being dramatic I literally can't see but I can see enough to see you right now and I can get around like you just like the amount of things like just such basic stuff that not a single person knows and because you don't have a cane like people don't you literally just have to explain it over and over and over and over and, and over again that's that's why I ended up getting the cane my right, my yeah. vision teachers me had too. to beg my parents to let me have a cane because I grew up sighted and they didn't think that I needed one but Wait. Most of my day was spent either trying to pass as a sighted person or finally not being able to do something and finally having to give up the ghost and explain, I can't see, I'm blind, or uh, being asked every day by, by students, you know, why do your eyes wiggle? 
look at me like why why can't you know why can't you see th- yeah. things like that so finally so that is one of the biggest reasons why i carry a cane yeah me too because i mean it, that's the reason i do yeah yeah it does cut down on the weird conversations <laughs> right because it's it is unbelievably exhausting and that's shocking that your parents, because my parents wanted me to get a cane, but I was worried about the thing that you probably experienced being in school and having a cane because people already did treat me worse because I was blind and people already did a lot of ableist stuff. And I just knew that if I got a cane, that was going to increase exponentially. And so the idea of like, I was, it was already too much for me to handle the amount of ableism I was experiencing and the idea of experiencing any more. I was just like, I can't do that. Once I was out of school, I mean, the, I do think that school is more hostile than the world. Like, and I think that you just, because you have no control over your life. And I, I don't know if that's like, if that is more of a personal experience. I don't know how like universal that is to blind people. But that, I think for me, I found that school is definitely the worst part of my life when it comes to ableism. Oh, no, school is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> school is awful. It is yeah. an awful, awful place. Again, you know, I graduated the the school system the public education system in 2006 so you know it's 2020 maybe things have gotten better uh but yeah for me school could school was great but when it it was school was either really great or it was a nightmare hellscape i mean i got you know death threats for new you know people were going to do horrible things to me with my cane and i i don't know these people from adam you know i don't understand i don't know I don't know. Yeah. I was I was different, and when and especially in Alaska, where it's like very libertarian. It, well, <laughs> no, that's not not at all where I was going. Alaska is actually very conservative. Right, libertarian is conservative because oh. Southern California is the same way, and it's horrible because it's <laughs> the most ableist perspective you can have. Sorry, I know that we're like very, really maybe. With, even with Berkeley Cal being like the center of the well, Southern disability California. rights movement. Okay, and Berkeley. I mean, I know the Bay Area. The Bay Area is ableist. Berkeley is supposed to be like this mecca for disabled people. I didn't go to Berkeley because I was like, I'm not going to, a blind person is not going to be welcome here. So I don't know. But that maybe that was just my reading. But the amount of like actual reading you had to do to get a degree there meant that I can't imagine a blind person ever succeeded there. I, I almost went to the San Francisco Academy of Art and Design actually for voiceover stuff. Oh yeah. But it costs thousands. That's, I was going to say it's so expensive. Yeah. Such expensive the school, school was expensive and then to live they had dormitories but it cost thousands of dollars to just stay in the dorms and my parents were like no. Yeah no living never ever ever live in the Bay Area do not unless you're the heiress to some sort of Come, I don't know. You, sorry, I interrupted you though about Alaska. No, it's it's yeah. So I mean, being a Ala- being different and living in Alaska is real hard. Yeah, because there aren't very many people like you. Alaska is not set up for disabled people. Yeah, it is a very it's a it's a very able state because you know what do you do on the weekend? You go hiking. You go get lost in nature. You do you know all this outdoorsy stuff that is really hard for some disabled people to access. Now right. there are really cool programs like Challenge Alaska Mm -hmm. that specialize in getting sighted guides for blind and disabled folks to uh, go experience the outdoors. I've gone skiing with them. That was super fun. That's, I never did anything like that. I also just didn't have any, and and we should probably get back to the movie, talking about the, (laughs) the things in the movie. But I mean, I think this is all relevant because this is kind of, as much as we relate to the characters, this is far from our experiences. Yeah. And I mean, you can't, but it's really hard. You can't watch this movie without thinking about your own experience. Yeah, and what it would be like to, to like be in a school like that. Because like, just, I mean, for me being diagnosed at 15, having so little, you know, like just coming to terms with it was like, I was already had to leave college by the time I had started to like fully understand what, you know, it takes a decade to like, once you've been diagnosed to like really put it into your identity. And so for me, I guess, oh, I guess that was like a couple years ago that, that I was finally drew. I mean, you know, it takes a long time and I just didn't get that time because they, it was wasted on Mm -hmm. just not believing me. Um, But yeah, so I think that that's like, for me just seeing like oh my gosh to like be in high school and to like just have a social circle to i like 
I have blind people. I there was four people in my school who were blind, and I knew all of them and <laughs> tried Same to Z's. like be yeah. friends with all of yep. them. Yep. And I think that that is like something that is so needed and to have that community. And I just never used accessibility things because I was like. I just it was like well I've already had to like go through school without this stuff and it is a learning curve too and so it was just not worth it when I didn't have the support of a school whereas I feel like I could have like I would have probably done more to learn braille and other things if I had gone to a high school like that. So I had a BVI teacher a blind visually impaired teacher I think starting in the oh man as Except for kindergarten. I think starting wow. in the second or third grade, I, I had my own personal BVI teacher. How and then uh, it was cool if you got a cool teacher, which I did. I had I had three really cool teachers. Well, I had four. One of them, I'm pretty sure the, that man was the devil. But anyway. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, that's a whole, that's a long and involved and very sad story. Oh. Uh, but the three ladies I had were super cool. And... Um, Especially uh, Victoria, who was my high school BBI teacher, because she got it. I mean, she just she got it. You know, she was she like just supportive. We, we, she was incredibly supportive. I mean, she also had a, has a son who has Asperger's. Okay. So she, you know, she I, it's so hard to put into words. She just gets it. She, was she it like kind of me. emotional support as well as like yeah, the every, actual education support? Everything. Like we could joke around and goof off and, you know, say fuck and, you know, just be, you know, say bad words That's and just awesome. be people. That's she, really awesome. Yeah, she was, she truly was my best, is my best friend when she was my teacher. Yeah. You know, she, she still taught me things. I mean, I know how to cross streets and get around and ride the bus and everything because of her. That's awesome. But, you know, I remember more going over to her house and goofing off and drinking tea and you know <laughs> shooting the shit or whatever so yeah so I had that kind of education and then I had AIDS more in middle school I remember having AIDS than I remember than I did in high school I don't think I had any AIDS in high school um so what what is it just for like in class yeah so it was like in class note they'd help with note-taking Oh, okay. They would help describe things that were on the board. They would help me um, do did, my work, take tests. I mean, they never helped me cheat or anything. But like, did that affect me. your social life? Do you think? I mean, it's hard um, to say. No, that's a good question. Yes and no. So I, except for the blind friends I had, especially when it came to middle school and high school, I just didn't make friends very easily. I just stopped making friends because I couldn't, no one could relate to me right. and I couldn't relate to anybody else. You know, I was the, yeah. I, I was the fat blind kid who just kept to themselves and I got along much better with all of my teachers. Yeah. All I the time did. than any of the, the only other students I got along with were my blind friends and we saw each other, you know, at lunch every now and again or um, more during mobility stuff because oh, instead, yeah. instead of gym I had mobility training after school except for my senior year when they were like oh yeah so all your gym credits they uh they, all your mobility hours they won't count towards your uh, gym credit what for me, for me to graduate so I would have graduated summa cum laude but I had to take gym and I got a C what and that that fuck? kept me that kept me from graduating with honors. I will never I That's... will never let that go. No, I would never let that go either. I'll what never the let it go. Fuck? That's just it's so, so fucking stupid. Ableist and also just completely ridiculous and then what what, what could you have done? Like no, nothing. What the fuck? No, it was either not take the class and not graduate. So and my gym teacher did nothing to make to Things adapt successful. anything. Yeah, I never yeah, had that. Yeah, I hated gym. Gym was a problem starting in elementary school yeah me too. for me it yeah. gym is nightmare inducing it is awful i've had it is traumatizing I, yep i had one awesome gym teacher in middle school who, who was super cool and got me but any uh well and i had another really awesome gym teacher in my second elementary school because i changed schools my but my very first experience with a gym teacher uh was just terrible it would yeah. be to the point of traumatization 
I can't imagine a blind person who wasn't traumatized at some point during schooling through gym. It's a really messed up thing because there's so much sports stuff that you like. That's it. It can be hazardous. And mm-hmm. there's if you're not going to make it accessible, you should not be expecting blind people to do it. And they usually don't try. Yeah. So, no, they ne- I've never heard of someone trying yeah, so unless you, it's like a blind school, maybe. You either, Yes. So you either try and fail, which, you know, everybody's going to fail. Did. Uh, and then get mercilessly bullied and teased by the other kids. Yep. Okay. Or you sit on the sidelines with a book and just don't do anything. So, hey. Was that an option? Do you <laughs> no. know to do that? No, I wish. I was like, that's what no, I would do if that I, was an option. I know, right? No, 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 well, no. When no, I no. had like I undiagnosed asthma and it was also like in Southern California. So I, and I get heat stroke at the drop of a dime. It is, takes nothing. I've gotten heat stroke in a, you know, snowstorm. It's very easy for me to get heat stroke. So I, it was, it was beyond hellish. I think part, I'm like trying to think of stories. And I'm like, oh, these are all things that I have locked away and I don't want to talk about it because it's traumatizing. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Like section no. of my brain. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Def- definitely not. Definitely not. No. Thank goodness for, for my gym teacher in at my second elementary school because he actually gave a shit, which was awesome. It's still – unfortunately, the damage had been done. Right. And when I got to uh, middle school and high school, there was just no – it there was just no going back. Um, yeah. Luckily, I didn't have to do anything like stereotypically like dodgeball or – Wait, you didn't ever have to do dodgeball? No, I never, I don't, I don't ever remember doing dodgeball. Wow. Thank goodness. It just. At least you're inside for dodgeball and the trick to dodgeball is you sit at the corner. Mm, that's true. And you just let everyone else fucking. Dodgeball just wasn't a thing. I don't know if it, if it was the particular schools that I went to or if it's just in Alaska, it's just not a thing. Dodgeball's just not a thing. <laughs> it's definitely a thing in Southern California. It's like the main one everyone wants to play. Oh my God, fuck dodgeball. No. That one at least is a blind my my not as much but like my kind of blindness i feel like that one's a little bit easier because it's indoors and so that means i'm not because once the sun is out i'm just like i can't see anything like i'm really it is truly blinding like i it is impossible for me to see what's going on and so like and then you have like a big field so i'm just like i am literally standing alone in an abyss and that's i mean that is truly what is happening and so like to try to do any sport is truly impossible um and to the point that looking back i'm like they shouldn't have made me do that like it doesn't make any sense because like what they're expecting me to do is just so beyond like what i could physically do but that was just not a consideration that my school is no yeah and i don't know i don't know where the where the line is with with stuff like that because i think you know anyone should learn about exercise and how to be healthy and how to do you have to how do to do like these things in a way that is going to be helpful yes oh absolutely because all know. i was doing was making was affecting my social life because you have to like be on a team with people and you physically can't do the thing they're expecting you to do so then you are letting other people down it's like a really fucked up right. thing to no, do to someone. I, yes <laughs> and then and then you know you're the last one picked or no one wants to pick you at all or you are you know brought to the point of tears and just no. you sob through the through the entire class it's so. like yeah no it's it's i feel it like we need to do like a mindfulness and meditation in the middle <laughs> yes. of this just to like ground ourselves oh my god it, talking about it at high school gym is like and so yes <laughs> and nobody nobody in gym ever brings up adaptive sports oh yeah it's just not a thing there are so many ad- ways to adapt sports for blind visually well, impaired and folks. And even in the movie we see them do some stuff. They mm-hmm. we see them do sports like they run. Yep. They do some running where it's track like, and field. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like holding on to the there's like a thing you can hold on to to see where Oh the you're gu- going. the guideline. Yeah I've yeah, done yeah, I've yeah. done track and field well, like that. Because haven't yeah. you you went to like blind king camp, right? Yeah. I've like never gone to ever do anything oh my God, organized it was so, with blind people. It was so fucking cool dude the, i went i could only go for two years because i kind of sort of aged out of the program and the third the third year i was supposed to go i got chicken pox oh no or at least we thought i had chicken pox and i had to miss camp but as, as much as i was upset about that i, I was already camping with my family anyway so it's was, it was fine but yeah no the two years that i went it was amazing because we learned not only are there just all these awesome sports that are made for blind and visually impaired there are tons of ways that you can adapt sports 
Right, uh, to be accessible. To, yeah, to be more accessible. Right, and I think that that's, like, and I think that, that also, like, is at the heart of the movie. It's just, like, the fact that if you're not getting a bunch of blind people together, that people are unwilling to make things accessible on an individual level. And, um, you know, I think Southern California, Alaska, Texas, all extremely, like, libertarian conservative places where people are not going to accommodate you like and there's not a sense of if you have a diverse group of people you want to make everyone feel welcome like if you have a diverse group of people you want to make the people who have the most access to whatever's going on feel welcome and then everyone else can fucking figure it out like and that is the mentality I think in all three of those places correct me if I'm wrong but that's the sense I get (laughs) um yeah no that's I mean Alaska that's pretty much it yeah figure it out (laughs) right exactly i mean like there's a certain it's a very like specific american thing that i I really do think southern california alaska and texas might be the most of all in the whole country too i'm like this (laughs) i maybe like some other like places maybe like colorado or something but it is yeah i don't know it because i think a lot about the these little tiny 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 towns you know wherever i mean my folks live in rice lake wisconsin there is nothing in Rice Lake, Wisconsin for you if you're a disabled person. Right. There's nothing. There's no public transportation. So how are you going to get around? There's no Uber. So, you know, what What? what are you going to do? Yeah. There's... That's a lot of the country. That, I mean, like, I guess maybe now Uber and Lyft are maybe going out to places that... Like, because growing up in Southern California, I didn't have any options. Like, and that was partly because... Like, it was way before a time of Uber left, so I just didn't have the ability to get around ever, and so I had to depend on other people just for kind of really basic, like, transportation stuff that I just couldn't even imagine having to do now just because it's so... It, it, like unreasonable to expect someone because people always got their license when they were 15 because they were like and people who were 13 were like I can't live this way like I have so little independence I can't do anything which is why like by the time people were 15 they instant they could get a permit they did and that was always my dream um so like you know up until the week before I my birthday I which is when I was diagnosed or the week before my half birthday since 15 and a half and that was when I was diagnosed so I never got to drive but I was looking for I mean it was the only thing I cared about Mm -hmm. um for about a year and a half before that um and because it just meant is the ability to be a human being or not be a human being and and that's yeah I mean it definitely I think that kind of thing just makes it seem like you can't really ask for things either because it's just like if such basic stuff is just going to be denied you and that no one because I would also people be angry at me because I needed to get somewhere and they were like I don't want to have to drive you around I'm like okay cool I don't like I don't want that either like this is not but you can drive like and that is not a thing that I get to keep doing like when I'm not around like and so there it just made all the friend dynamics like there was just an inherent power imbalance and and also everyone was annoyed with me because I needed riots and I was like okay this is great like this is not a thing I can control you know and so it's just like one of those things where you don't ask for anything at that point because you know that that's not that doesn't lead to anywhere good so you'll just do anything that you could possibly figure out how to do you'll do like even if it's like you know gives you a really bad headache or something you know like you just you just try to figure it out because you know that it's worse to ask for help at least that was my experience <laughs> um but yeah I mean I, yeah we should time on the movie so <laughs> don't get too far down these rabbit holes of like <clears throat> stress but yeah I mean I think going to a non-blind high school is is traumatizing and and so having that experience does there's still so much value for them i feel like but do we want to talk more about the characters yeah so so um like we said we meet we meet uh our four kids who at the beginning of the film uh are all attending the the school for the blind yeah and we meet Chaz, who uh like you said is living in an apartment uh with a roommate he's all about his music yep and and his mom also um, was vision impaired because he has a yes. genetic condition. So yes. that's um, a fact about him that mm-hmm. with other characters. So that was interesting, yep. though. It seemed like because he had a not very good relation. Like his mom was not a very like present or reliable person. No, and he he admits that he uh, he lives in the apartment. He basically got legal emancipation when he was right. 17 from his family because he just can't depend on them anymore. Right, right. Nothing ever got done. Yeah, which I mean, I imagine having a lot of like factors that 
makes you know like poverty like we talk, we see how little access to finances he has and like but he also like I think a lot of blind people is very reliable and tries very hard to figure out because that's part sure. of his story well he has to or he's gonna be homeless right exactly and, and then but then he still winds up homeless because his roommate the abled one doesn't wait was he able or was he also blind no i'm pretty sure he was sighted okay i don't but did you think he was because I, I found it first in the first scene but yeah then the rest i thought of it, he i was, thought he was blind but oh but wait the other the other guy you see in the other scenes that's his friend that's one of his other friends. Oh, so his housemate's also blind? I oh, thought I he, thought maybe his housemate right. was also blind because they were they're both going to the school. It might have been that his cuz you see his friend cuz the part of it is the housemate is not like is kind of not being very reliable. No, well the housemate skips town. Right. And leaves him to alone the bag basically. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so that's I think maybe why I didn't keep track of what cuz I think Part of it is the audio descriptions didn't actually give you, <laughs> I don't think, enough info. I mean, they weren't they weren't good enough to really keep track of the characters because I just assumed if there was another person in the house that was his housemate. Yeah, no, there, <laughs> there were there were a couple of people. Yeah, yeah okay, that yeah. that must have been what you, I. But you up. only see his housemate in like one or two scenes because then he bumps. You know, and okay, bounces. that yeah. must have been why I mixed them up because I never really got to see what his actual housemate looked like, I think, then. Um, but yeah, anyway, so well, he... We know we know something's up with Chaz when his friend comes over and there's no lights in the apartment and I kind of giggled because I'm like, aha, you know, he, he, they don't right, need of lights. Course. Like, why would, why lights? would they need lights? But there is literally no power in the apartment. Right, because he has to, like, take a cord and bring it into from, like, the outside of the mm-hmm. complex. Mm-hmm. Um, because he can't pay his electric bill. And that's, like, to power the computer because he doesn't need lights. Um, <laughs> but he does make music, which um, I, I liked. I like that. I like that a lot of the characters had, like, artistic pursuits. Yeah. Uh, we meet Denise, who is turning 16, and she is trying to put herself out there and she ends up being in the production that the school has of Into the Woods. Yeah. And she gets Cinderella, which is super cool. That's a really cool part. But you get to see her go from this kind of really shy, doesn't you know, eh, not really sure about her environment to this, um, well, I'm not going to say like, you're a confident young woman because, you know, she's still trepidatious she reminded you, me of myself so much yeah at that age you get to see her grow a little bit yeah <laughs> no it's really i um did you do you feel who which character do you feel like you related to the most megan nice i like how we each related to one of mm-hmm. the female characters yes the most. <laughs> i definitely was not valedictorian of my class she was which was awesome and i don't have a master's degree but does she get a message? She does. Oh, yeah. nice. In the, in the where are they now thing. In the yeah. quiet voiceover. Yeah. Well, that and the thing I read on the internet. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, she, she is, uh, she went, she went to college and got her degree in counseling. Okay. Um, mental health stuff. Right. And she is a uh, substitute teaching at the school now. Oh, yeah. I think that might be in the movie. Or actually now, but she's. Not only is she was she substitute teaching, she's actually a staff member now. Oh, is, so but she is she a teacher? teacher? Okay, yeah, yeah she's yeah, a teacher yeah. there now. That's awesome, and that's because that's really cool. Because there wasn't a lot of blind. You didn't. Mm-hmm. I don't think we saw any blind teachers there, or at least it wasn't obvious if they were. Yeah. But I, there was a decent amount of things where I saw people like very much using their eyesight, like as teachers. Like the the, I saw a lot of the staff members like using eyesight. And mm-hmm. so it did definitely seem like most well, of the staff was sighted. Yeah, and I mean, you, yes and no. Like, you don't know. I mean, because the school is uh, blind and visually impaired. So I think it's a whole range of of vision. But, right, but I think they're like... Yes, you're right. A lot of the staff, I think, was is sighted. Right, because I always assume that they are. And I feel like if you are blind... And you're teaching in a blind school, you're not going to bother, like, trying to act like you couldn't see everything. Because I know I'll do the thing where I'm, like, kind of acting like I can see what's going on. But if you're in a blind school, you don't have to do that. Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like you would use your – in that – if I was in that 
place even though I could still see things I would use my I wouldn't use my vision at all basically because I'd be like I don't need to this is like a blind school you know like I feel like that would be my reaction but I mean I guess everyone's different but but I do feel like there was a lot of them that it kind of seemed like they were there to like kind of use their sight or like we're even telling saying what things might be present like like giving visual information out loud so like they were you know kind of like a sighted guide person Mm -hmm. too which I don't know I I always feel like you don't need that if you're gonna do all the work of having a blind school you can just have blind teachers I mean like if you're you have to put in all the groundwork to make it accessible to the students sure (laughs) sure but even even the National Federation of the Blind has cited people run their shop when when we're dealing with when they're dealing with money right but do you think that that's a that do you think that's good well they we see Megan has a job that uses money yes so that oh that's a that's another subject too so Megan has a job and Chaz gets a job as well and this is it's very interesting because it's at two completely opposite ends of, of the spectrum, at least for me. Because uh, I can't say that Chaz's work isn't rewarding work. Like, he's getting – he's has a job, he's making money. Right. For me, I could never do that job. I could – it is absolute. I just don't understand how someone could be content with a, with a job like that. You sit in a room and you – assemble things all so he works in well a, he assembles he, like one thing right because right. it's for military he, equipment yeah he works in this lighthouse warehouse light, lighthouse it's called lighthouse for the blind yeah and they do things um the, the assembly it looks like they do a lot of assembly work so yeah he assembles chin straps for uh military helmets yeah i'm not saying that's not important work it it is i mean they need you know they you're con- you are contributing you are contri- yeah they need their chin straps you are contributing to society like, i am not the judge and jury if as far as like is your job good but i've heard a, a lot of like i've heard a lot of things about disabled people that's the jobs that are available and fit for disabled people and and those jobs are usually run by people who can dictate how much they can they can pay you so right. a lot of the people who work there are not making minimum wage right because well because this is something that not everyone might not every able person might know but it is legal in most states i think it's a majority of states so maybe not all to pay disabled people below minimum wage yes. that that is a legal thing mm-hmm. that is true in the majority of states as you can legally and I'm sure it's true in Texas. Texas definitely seems like a state where that would be true. Um, but that is a very common thing that I think people who are not disabled are not aware of. Um, but most disabled people, I think, are aware because it is legal. Um, if you if your disability, like, affects the job work, which, like, literally every single job is made for sighted people. So we always have to, like, find accommodation. So you could say that about literally any job because it's like no job is completely visionless you know like because it's all made for sighted people so if that's the thing you can just pay people less than minimum wage legally um so he yeah so, so Chaz works there and yeah i mean i can't i definitely can't come in you know as this glorious angel and say i have a better opportunity for you and this is below you why are you doing this if it's a job that is paying him money which he needs desperately Brilliant. then this is his job then and that's what he does i'm just scared that he he and people like him and people in that situation are being totally taken exploited. advantage of and exploited yeah yeah i mean i think that that's definitely a possibility i think that like from my experience like there's so like there's a sense of like if you get a disabled person a job done you know like in the social services thing it's like as long as you get them anything like it's almost like a job for a blind person is actually the employer's the one who's doing the service mm-hmm. like not you and like I mean, you are just like helping you know an employer is helping you out by giving you a job you know like it's not yeah and maybe it's just i'm imposing my beliefs and my lifestyle onto chaz and that's not fair either so, so he so he works there. Megan has a job. She works at a bistro, and it seems that this bistro maybe it's it's run by the school or it's run by people. It's run by a blind person because everything in this bistro, I'm guessing, is 
adapted for a blind person. The, the cash register talks, right, which is very important. And, and then she's able to get the money in. And I'm not sure what system they have to. I was thinking about that, too. I'm guessing it's all memorization. Like from, from, right, because that would make sense. And then I wonder where you put the money, though. But it's you would have to ask what what you're being handed if you couldn't see it. Right. But then that seems like that could be a problem. Like, just logistically, like, because someone could just be like, here's, you know, $40 sure. and oh, it's two sure. ones, you Absol- know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You would hope that people uh, would, wouldn't do that to you. Right. You know, but you- I imagine there's like, there's, I'm sure that there's some, I can't, I, I can't imagine they'd be going off um, just trust because you can't trust people. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe there's a sighted person who works there also. Who like, um, yeah, I mean, it is, I wish we see that and I like how it talks, but I was really like, oh, but wait, how does this work? Like what? We don't, this is not enough information to know how this all works. Like, cause I really wanted to know that cause there should be, um, I wish that there was an answer cause this is a big problem with blind people talk about, you know, we can't see money. And so it takes a lot of jobs, um, it makes a lot of jobs inaccessible, and because the government is not a government that's willing to actually make the money accessible, unlike many other governments right. that a do have of, accessible money. A lot of countries, the bills are different sizes. Yeah, like Denmark, um, every single coin, every single bill has a different, you can just, I, it was so amazing. I would have just a bunch of like money in my pocket, and I could like literally tell you the amount of money I had. Just without taking anything out of the pocket, out of my that pocket, super it's cool. so cool. My mom tried to get me to recognize the different coins by the size, obviously, because they're all different sizes. But also, if you feel on a penny or a quarter or a nickel, they all have different grooves in the sides. Oh yeah. Well, there's which are the two that you can't really, you can barely tell the difference between. I think is it like quarters and nickels? It's quarters and nickels that trip yeah. me up all the time. I don't. I feel like if the difference is so minuscule that it's it should be better like you know like in Denmark they have like either they are they have a circle in the middle or they don't and the sizes are very different mm. um so you know like they're actually made it seems like they were made partly to accommodate blind people like it it seems like that is actually the reason why they're like that as opposed to here where it's like with the nick because of how close the nickel and the quarter are it just seems like okay so this is never ever blind people were never thought about even with the coins because there's definitely not this is this was not made like because you could do so much easy stuff to make them easy to tell the difference between but they aren't you know it's extremely hard but yeah because they're almost the same size Mm -hmm. and and I think is the corner like maybe a little bit thicker. There, it's, it's a little it's bit, almost it's a impossible. little bit bigger, and maybe maybe a little thicker. I'm not. I don't know. But it's like um, maybe if you had both of them, you could tell the difference. Oh yeah. But if, if you I just had, have if one, I had both, yeah. Right. If you yeah. just have one, you can't really tell. Yeah. Uh. So, Megan. So Megan works at this bistro, which is super cool. I. It, that's awesome. What a what a neat job. I was just happy to see a cash register that talked because I've yeah. had to deal with cash registers. And those are they not made talk. for blind people yep. and they don't talk. Yep. So, yeah, I've had the same problem. And it's very I mean, like for one of my jobs, like a very small part of it is like charging people stuff. And it is I like have so much anxiety every single time oh my I God. ever do anything. I'm like my heart's racing. It's so nerve wracking. Somebody would walk into the visitor center and want to buy something. And I just yeah, I'm just like, can I just give it to you? Just, I'm just going to give it to you and you can just leave and you know. It's fine. It'll be between you and me. I will pay for it out of my lunch money. Don't oh don't God. worry about it. You want the puzzle? You just take it. Just go. Although our, it's much more modern now. But when we first started, our, oof, our cash register, our system was archaic. I mean, people would ask, people would ask to pay for a credit card, and we literally had one of those old, um, you know, the slide things, and you put the credit card in and like slide it and get an imprint of the credit card. Oh my God. That's what we were working with. It oh was my gosh. nuts. So That's ridiculous. It, it was very stupid, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. We talked about everybody. Oh, yeah. And then Isaac is the last person. Right. Um, he is kind of our the awkward duck of yeah. the group. He's just, just him, himself. He's just trying to figure everything out. Well, because he also like went because he winds up getting at the end he winds up getting expelled and having to go to a public school. But I think didn't he start? Didn't he also start? 
high school in a public school? Mm, no, or am I, I he, misremembering he that? Was, I think he was always at the blind school, or at least it, for high school. Okay. Yeah, and then... Maybe he went to a site of middle school. Maybe, I think maybe. that might have been what happened. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And apparently, <laughs> we don't find out very much, which is interesting yeah. because, again, this is not the story that the documentarian wanted to tell. Yeah. But he just kind of glosses over the fact that, like, yeah, Isaac got um, asked to leave the school because of, of unwanted physical stuff. And I'm just like... Well, no, I think they say, don't they say like inappropriate? Inappropriate, sorry, is, not un, not unwanted. I'm but sorry, but it's but that's the thing. It's like inappropriate is so annoyingly vague in which, a way that it's like that mm-hmm. could actually mean two things, and one of them is not that big of a deal, and one of them is a very big deal. Which got me thinking about like all these these kids are all high schoolers, so and they're in Texas. So what kind of a right. of a sex ed health education are they getting? And also, someone in the movie says. Maybe and maybe it is Isaac, but someone said, you know, oh well, blind people were very touchy. We're very touchy feely. Right. And I'm thinking, okay, you are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I don't know. I don't well, know if you, you could need say to that. like teach consent, not abstinence, and and it seems not very unlikely that in 2008 and nine, Texas was teaching correct, yeah, sexual education. So yeah, I don't know. We, uh, yeah, I, I can't I can't speak to that, but. I, I felt pretty bad. I feel like we can deduct him. though, to what Texas was doing. <laughs> I think there's a good More chance unlikely. it was it was very bad sex mm-hmm. education. Yeah. Um, so I I kind of felt bad for I kind of felt bad for Isaac, but you know I felt bad for him too. And it just seemed like it seemed like it was probably very problematic. Something problematic happened in a way that we don't we didn't mm-hmm. have any clue I, into even I, how it was or what it was. Yeah, or I mean if if. Maybe he was talked to several times by teachers and he just ignored everything that was said and kept doing whatever he was doing. And then I guess, you know, hey, if you can't keep your hands to yourself, dude, you, know, yeah. you really can't go here. I mean, that, yeah, it is a really hard, it's, yeah, it was annoying how unspecific they made it. So it was very hard to tell. It could have been that, like, it was a consenting other student, like, you know, and that that was, yeah, we just mm-hmm. didn't have any context to it. So that made it kind of weird but but yeah he is sent uh he is asked to leave the the school and he um as far as the end of the documentary he is back on the back on the farm living with his parents right he or right yeah. that and and going to public school yes and going to going to public school yeah which is a very sad thing where he's all alone and and this is also something that um that yeah. in Denise's um, her kind of arc, she talks about how difficult, how just shut off from everyone she was when she wasn't at a blind school. I related to her a lot because there's like she's just very, um, I think, just wanted to kind of be seen in a way like and felt like she had to conform. But like on her birthday, she was like crying and just being like, it me so much of being that yeah, age. just being <laughs> surrounded by people who. Who not are like her. Who are like her. But Which, not not only that, but people who acknowledge her as a person. Right, right. And that would have meant the world to me at that age. Like, oh, my gosh. And I did not really have that. But I just the idea that that would be possible would have made me cry at that age. <laughs> well, people who I want a friend who acknowledges my who, you know, acknowledges my blindness and who doesn't ostracize you ex- exactly and who knows that i am more than the fact that i can't see well and then she gets to be herself because i think mm-hmm. part of what she was saying was like she just didn't she wasn't allowed to be outwardly blind oh the, and i think that was what i related to the most too. yeah and the yes and the the audition her audition story <gasps> she went she went to audition in, at public school so for her good. for this play and they handed her the sides and they're in print and she said i can't read this and so they just they, well then obviously you can't audition for the play. Yeah. And that, as a theater person, that makes me so sad and so angry. I was furious, and I was like, Melissa must be even more furious. <laughs> I like, was, I was very pissed. Yeah, yeah. I, I was not happy because I still go through this. Right. Auditions in this town are not set up for disabled people because a lot of people just assume that oh you're a disabled person theater just you're not going to do that it's just not it's something that is not accessible to you so i come i come to an audition the sides are either uh 
well, they're not, they're, they are, the sides are too small for me to see. I can't read these. And so I have to do the audition with a script in my face. Yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, I can't. And then it's like, you can't actually perform. And it's also like, that's one of those things where it's just like the amount of work you have to do to accommodate someone is so small. Like, and the idea that you couldn't just do that is, Mm -hmm. is so baffling to me. Like, you know. Yeah. I mean, what we did in college and in, in all throughout conservatory is, uh, you blow it, you send it to me, and I can blow it up on my iPad. Right. And that way I yeah, can that's... audition. You know, or or I'm forced to go outside and try and memorize as much of it as I can. Right, right. So that I can walk in there and just be like, okay. Da, 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 da. Which I like, I always had to memorize absolutely everything that was performance, which is why I stopped performing until mm-hmm. I was like 25 and was like, oh, I'll try improv because you don't have to look at anything. <laughs> exactly. But like I stopped performing in sixth grade because I was doing a few different things where I'd have to memorize. It, and I was like, this is just not worth my time anymore. And so I gave up like multiple things because I was like, I can't do this. I don't like just having to spend so much time memorizing stuff. It's yeah, it's well, unfair. And, and um, the fact that a lot of people won't let you perform on stage with a cane. Right. Because you're, the character that you are playing isn't blind. Right. But uh, one, of the, one of the neatest plays I ever got to do was Titus Andronicus because the director made Titus blind. Right, because it's like you do like, you know, like the Wiz or something. Like you can do, <laughs> you can make things where people are a different identity and that's like a part of the art. I was like, there's a long tradition of that. Like in theater why the fuck can't you do it with just like that does it yeah and these ridiculous. these students you don't get to see a lot of it but you get to see bits and pieces they're putting on into the woods you know these students do a full production of into the woods they've got a set they've got costumes they you know everything and every they student all have canes and they all have canes yeah and it's great and it as again you don't get to see very much of it but the little that you do get to see it doesn't detract from the show it is the same show Everybody has a cane. Well, and I think that that's like seems so manageable and also like it's art. And the point of art is not like you have to get it exactly right and do things exactly by the book. Like that's the exact opposite of what art is. Like you art is about like change is about changing things and making things other than what they're quote unquote supposed to be. And like, you know, actually putting humanity back into stuff that maybe it wasn't before and so like all of that is is very much like making having blind people playing characters that are supposed to be sighted is like so much more artistic like that's just more true to what art is like so the idea that you wouldn't want to do that is just like well you shouldn't be making art then because you suck like you suck at art like screw you i walk i walk a really fine line as a performer because when I, you know, when I perform, I don't, I don't use a cane, and I usually will take my glasses off if the if that's what the director wants. Because I don't necessarily need my glasses to see. It makes my vision a little worse. But you've had so many rehearsals by that point. I know where my mark is right, and where you know my, where you know, where is. everybody is, and I know, right. I know what everyone's reactions are supposed to be. But I, you know, if I'm doing a scene with somebody and they're having a reaction across the stage from me, I can't see them, so they have to make it bigger, so I know what is happening. Or we have have we have to, which usually happens. We run the scene so many times. Isn't that what I know what's going to is? happen. Isn't that like actually? I mean, unlike improv, that stuff should be easier because you. Like, it's, you don't need a blind person in a cast to, like, make sure that everyone knows where they're supposed to be and, like, when they're supposed to be there and what what happens when and, like, how well, the yeah, pacing I mean, of it. Like, that's what, isn't that's that me- what That's theater the mechanics. Is? That's the mechanics of theater. Right. But then that's, like, actually more accessible to blind people than other things because when in life is there you know most of life has a lot of chaos built into it and so you do have to adapt to things that you don't necessarily have the ability to perceive whereas with theater like it is the, it is actually unnatural and that like you don't have that like there is chaos but it's kind of like trying to actually quantify as much of the chaos as possible and so that makes it more accessible well sure i mean yeah i mean everybody every scene is blocked Right, so exactly. You know, That's like yeah, helpful you, to blind people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so you know where your what your path is and where you're supposed to go and what in what is happening. Right, so you can't make an argument that blind people are going to be bad at theater because we actually like 
in there is some built in mechanics at theater that makes it even easier than normal life for blind people mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's part of like, and the fact that you do have to memorize it. I mean, and that's why it's really frustrating because the audition is very inaccessible and it's probably the least accessible part of the whole yes. thing. And, you and so to, you just get discriminated against. Right. Basically. And you have to bring your best self to the audition or pray to go, you know, pray to the theater gods that somebody knows you and has worked right, with you like or has seen, seen you. you. Right. And they can be like, oh yeah, no, I'll vouch for this person. Like they're super capable and they can do X, Y, and Z. Right. Well, that's true. Of so many things in life. I feel like like jobs are the same way. Like you can't get an interview is extremely challenging, but anytime someone's worked with you, they can vouch for you because you're very skilled and know what you're doing. And I feel like that's, if that happens in most aspects of our life that's something going on with how society views blindness and is has nothing to do with us you know that's how i got my radio job is i had been working volunteering there for years and everybody could vouch for me right it sure as hell wasn't my cover letter in my resume no i've literally terrible i've never gotten a single thing because of just yeah no it's a hundred percent of the time it's because i had people who could vouch for me i like most of the you know the both jobs i have right now are i had to volunteer for you know uh, one for like a year and the other one for six months but you know like i've never had an opportunity that didn't first involve like every single person at that organization knowing me already before i could get paid like you know that's been my experience and i think that's pretty common um because because i think but i think that that speaks to the fact that the expectations of blind people from sighted people are vastly different than that reality and i think so i think that that speaks to that being the only problem like that's the problem like and it's not that we are you know unable to do things like and i think or that like certain things are just so unaccessible that you can't make them accessible a Mm -hmm. lot of times it's literally just people don't have a good enough imagination to understand how a blind person would fucking kill at this and and it's a and it's that's what makes seeing the performance so special and amazing and they're just it's it's a performance of into the woods like like, which a lot of high schools have done like there's nothing unique about it you know it is it is what it is but these students are getting to do it lots of students who probably wouldn't get wouldn't even be right considered for any of the roles are are getting to do it and all they all they did was add canes (laughs) They yeah. didn't change much of anything. They just added, just let let the person be themselves and let them use a cane. That's what's why whatever, I don't know what job I'm going to move into next with, with everything that's going on, but I refuse to not work without my cane anymore. Nice. I'm done. I'm done with it. Yeah. Well, a, lot of the, a lot of the jobs I've worked with, I didn't necessarily need to move around a lot, so I didn't need to have a cane. Right. But I am sick and tired of people getting angry at me because I can't do something as fast as they want or because uh, I can't find something that they're that they're looking for or what I'm because I'm not passing as a sighted person I'm tired and done and it's sick of it stupid. so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on my cane from now on yeah no it's definitely and I think that yeah and and, and the movie brings up a lot of stuff where it's just like you have this safe haven of like blind stuff and accessibility and it does i wonder i mean and i wish that we could get to this but i also wonder how as they grow well actually you know a little bit more but um of the different people how their life like in the future what they were able to achieve and i wonder how much of that like having that formative experience i mean it's almost impossible to do like an a true experiment about this because you know you can't run back history with the same people but like but how much that maybe opened up doors or maybe it made it it might have also made it harder once you get out right. of school to I, like adapt yeah i was super curious after watching the film to i had to know where all these kids ended up so i looked uh and did a little bit of research there's not too much that i found online but i did find a little blurb from independent leds uh, from PBS that talks about where each of the kids ended up. Um, Isaac ended up obviously not not going to the to the blind school anymore, but he did manage to uh, graduate high school. He, and he lives now with his folks and his seeing eye dog. 
Aww. So he actually got a seeing eye dog named Rolex, which is pretty cool. Um, it's in May of 2009, um, Isaac and his seeing eye dog, uh, they're currently living in Austin where he is uh, strengthening his independent living skills at an adult rehab center. Uh, and his goal is to attend a four-year university. Um, wait, when was this posted? Uh, this was posted the, the night after the documentary premiered. So oh, I'm assuming in oh, 2010. Okay. Oh, so these are not like super up. To- it's not th- this is all I could find. They're so this is probably not too far from what was in yeah. the movie is like little not blurbs. too far. Yeah. Cuz I was like oh, he still hasn't been able to get to college. It's no, been no, 10 no. Years. I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure he's probably completed his college or whatever, but yeah, um Megan obviously at the end of the documentary was a valedictorian of her class like she wanted, which was super cool. Because she's very, she's super studious. I mean, she's awesome. Yeah, she's very yeah type A, like, mm-hmm. get it done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So she graduated valedictorian. And of she her, had of a blind class. boyfriend. And she does, yeah, yeah, she did, which was and really was cute. cute. And they went out to lunch and everything. And yeah. I mean, really, like, if you go to a blind really school, cute. you date other blind people. I was, like, mm-hmm. thinking, I'm like, I just the, you know, obviously, I just wasn't, didn't have any blind oh, people in my no. life to meet. The thought, the, and the thought of dating anyone, no, no one was going to date me when I was in high school. No, yeah. no, 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 no. So Megan continues to take care, uh, to take a curriculum classes at Austin Community College. She continues to, to achieve all A's and B's. And Megan began working part-time at the, at the Texas School for Blind and Visually Impaired as a substitute teacher and has since been hired on as a full-time resident advisor. Uh, on a daily oh. basis, yeah, on a daily basis, Megan is Megan is working with teen girls in the TSBVI dorms, serving as a role model to students only a couple of years her junior. Right, because this would have been soon after. So that's probably, she's yeah. on a different course she, at this point. Yeah, she does plan to, to complete a four-year degree and get a uh, four-year college term and get a bachelor's and a master's degree it would really be in interesting to actually know she did that because i feel like blind people are we always have those ideas and then we have to go to school and we're know. like oh this sucks i know oh my god <laughs> Never uh mind. denise uh during her sophomore year denise's mother decided to bring her back to dallas to attend her zoned high school oh. this agreement didn't work out too well uh for denise and she ended up leaving that school as well Denise lives with her mother uh, and little sister. She still sings in her church choir and is taking some life skills classes and is looking for the right job training program. Wow. So that that stinks. I mean, it's really it's really interesting. A lot of these kids, you you can't, I don't ever, I don't want to say like all, all these kids didn't succeed. Like Megan is the only one that succeeded because yeah. she took the conventional path. You know, she right. graduated school. She went to college, da, da, da. I, yeah that, there's no room if you don't do that and the problem is right. that you know the majority of blind people don't do because they mostly can't you know like it's just not like that's it's the most treacherous path to try to do what everyone else can do because you're never gonna have the validation of like i'm not sure if it's because they can't i i think it's the system isn't really set up right. for us you know the deck is kind of sort of stacked that's what against I mean. us yeah, when we yeah, begin yeah, yeah. but you know, Isaac's in a in a rehab in a, in a rehab program. Denise is doing looking to do the same thing or for a job training program. I think that's awesome. I think it's sad that that her mother pulled her out of the school so she could attend a regular high school that obviously didn't work. Well, and she even says it's so obvious in the documentary that she needs this emotionally. Like, and that I guess I can't imagine. I mean, it, when I was that age, I would have been so happy to go to a, a, that school like that would have been amazing but then like I also if I went I couldn't go back because I like all of high school I was just you know I just didn't let myself think about something like that because it would be too hard to keep going if I knew that was another option so if I went to that school and then had to go back I would have dropped out like there's no way you would continue going to high school that's in that's ridiculous given just the vast difference between 
how you're perceived in one and the other if you get a taste of like actually being validated for who you are at that age you're not going to want to go back to the extremely invalidating situation like what yeah so it seems so silly when she was doing so well it makes you wonder like why yeah I mean my first thing my first thought honestly is financial reasons yeah you know we're never told how much it costs to attend this school because i'm this is a boarding school this cannot be a public school right because that's the thing is i'm like yeah it probably is not a public school like i don't do they have public schools for the blind i'm not sure probably not to be honest yeah no i was because i was thinking because i don't know yeah yeah which is kind of ridiculous if if public schools don't make a great effort to actually have that robust accommodations right they should really either right. make those or have mm-hmm. or make the school because mm-hmm. it's also like you know first of all blindness it's not a good thing you choose to do so you know you need the accommodations no matter what and it also means that you're gonna have less ability to like financially support your parents as you get older so you know it's not like that's like taking out money or something is and all practical so yeah yeah but that's a main problem with a lot of disability in schools like mm -hmm. that's a big big problem and Chaz starts the film already kind of on thin ice because he's missed six days of school and he just decides that uh it's not for him he doesn't want to do it anymore and so he drops out well it's uh, when in in the middle it's when he's told that he's gonna have to do an entire another year oh right this the this second year which um their second senior year which back home we called super seniors right we did too yeah so yeah he's told he's gonna he can graduate but he has to be a super senior and he is not about that life so yeah he uh he decides to uh leave school would you have done the same thing in his position i i know i would have <laughs> no really no i i was so focused on getting uh my high school diploma and then getting a, co- a college degree. Yeah. I'm Well, you you actually went to college. And I was like, I will do four years of this and then I will get a degree or I won't. And one of them I did and one of them I didn't. <laughs> I am I am a stubborn, 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 stubborn person uh, when it comes to when it came to things like that. So, yeah, I if I if I was going to go to high school and spend all this time, I wasn't leaving there without a diploma. If I was going to go to college, I wasn't leaving there without a degree. Even yeah. if it took me 10 years. Right. Whereas I'm like, I almost I, did. <laughs> I gave my four years and it's kind of, and I'm like, well, fuck you if you're not going to give me a degree. Cause I like work 10 times harder than all the other students for four, the same amount of time. And I had friends who had already graduated who started the same time as I did. Cause they, it was so easy for them. So yeah. Um, but, but that's, I think. Yeah, I mean, I was very, very stubborn up until the very end, but then I was just like, okay, so this is not worth it for me anymore. Oh, yeah, no. (laughs) Oh, trust me, it got harder towards the end. There were were multiple times. I went through multiple times in college where I was just like, I could just stop. I could just make all of this go away, and I could just stop. And every time I thought of that, I would, or every time I had that thought experiment, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't pull the trigger and just be like, you know what? I'm done. When did you start? Because I started my first quarter of college, I think, was the first time I had that thought. And then I do not think a quarter went by where I did not have that thought. Oh, Lord. (laughs) Oh, Lord. The first time I ever had that thought was actually after my first semester. Uh, I did horribly my first semester of college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Because I had never, in a nutshell, I had never been given this much freedom before. Oh, yeah. I had my own place. Well, my own dorm. uh, And there was no one there to tell me what to do if i wanted to go eat i could go eat if i wanted to go to the store i could go to the store if i wanted to go to class i could go to class and if i didn't want to go to class no i didn't have to know that was my promise i never went to class because i was always a very i my parents never told me to do homework like and stuff i always just did it on my own like i was very driven in that way but i was like if i had the option to not go to class i would not go Mm because i'm like i don't get anything out of them so i was just like i don't want to be there i'm not gonna get anything out of this like so so, yeah yeah, there's no motivation (laughs) so i got my report card at the at the end they're not called report cards but i don't remember it was my thing your grades my grades Whatever. i got there that is that's yeah. it i got my grades i got my grades at the end and i think i passed maybe one or two well i didn't outright fail anything um 
but I did get yeah, I, I did get knows. grades across the gambit. I got I got a cup. I got mm-hmm. like one B, and I think the rest were C's and D's. Yeah, this and, is a similar thing. Yeah, yeah, and I I called my mom just like this is what happened and uh, what what should I do? You know what what should I do? And she's like, well, you've made this make mistake now, so you probably don't want to make it again. Go get yourself some ice Did cream. You not make it again because it doesn't feel like it's your mistake. It's usually the fact that you can't. You oh, can't no. do better. Oh no know? no 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 no! I made I. <laughs> I graduated with a C average, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I would have as well. I'm not, yeah. I'm not an honor student by any stretch of the imagination. Now, all of the classes that are in my were in my major, I got good grades. Right. I was like a C average, but for film classes, I think I was like an A minus was right, my average. Right. Yeah. No, in my theater classes and, or and, maybe the an art, and the art classes that I took and most of my journalism classes, I got A's and B's. The only classes I failed outright were math classes oh. and the only classes i got shitty grades in were um lecture classes like just classes yeah. that i had to have All to the graduate general education yes yes yeah. yes yes yeah and i got it, so many bad grades it's yeah and it wasn't because i didn't care i just me i mean when my psych class was going on they needed somebody at the radio station because i was working at the radio station at this point yeah. And I was like, well, all the psych lectures are recorded and I want to make money. So <laughs> I'm going to go to work and yeah. I'll catch the lectures later, which I did. And then I read the book and I passed every single test. Wow. So, I mean, I did that, but I wasn't even getting paid to be on the radio. Yeah, I was just but, like, well, this is more accessible, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but, but my physical body was in that class maybe three times. Oh, yeah. I don't think most of the lecture, because you can't see what's going on. I have ADHD. So if I'm getting so little stimuli, I literally... I sat in lectures where I could not remember a single thing that was talked about. I, like, genuinely got nothing out of them. And when that happens to you enough times, you're like, well, this is a waste of my time. Like, because I would always think, like, well, I could be studying right now and actually learning something. But I also, at a certain point, stopped taking classes where I was interested because I was like, I took all these classes where I was super interested in the topic. And I very quickly realized that this was not going to be a chance to learn. This was going to be a chance to, like, do a bunch of busy work and, like, try so hard to, like, paddle, you know, to stay from drowning. And that was not, that's not an environment where you get to like learn stuff so I was like okay if I'm taking interest in classes I get so distracted by wanting to learn yeah well yeah and (laughs) when when it's if it's a class that has something that I'm interested in I I'll do it like I will put all of myself in it and you know yeah that's that's what I want but if it's a class that's hard or or I don't care about well did you feel like because I literally stopped taking interest in classes because that was the problem was I would get too interested in a topic I would give myself the opportunity to take one or two electives per semester I always had a um just a a whatever class like I'm taking this class because I want to because you have to take something you have to take something fun or frivolous or something that isn't gonna that doesn't add up to your uh degree because if you don't give yourself that opportunity just to do something that's fun, you're going to go crazy. Right. Well, so, I, I mean, I definitely took a lot of, like, film class, which is what I cared about. But, like, I would take, a, for the general education ones, I'd take classes where I was really, because I'm interested in a lot of different stuff. So, like, it was always classes I was interested in that I could take. And so that was why on paper I was like, this is so cool. Like, I get the chance to take everything I'd love to learn about. And I didn't learn about so much of the stuff that I took classes yeah. on because it wasn't accessible. And then that would just completely demotivate me because... I realized to do well in a class, you didn't, it wasn't about learning. Like doing well right. in a class and learning or two were just not compatible for, in my experience. And, and we, I don't know if that's universal. But. I mean, we had a disability department at the, at the U and they did really good work. You know, I wasn't the only disabled student. I was one of the few blind students, but I wasn't the only disabled yeah, student. Was the and they did, they did good work, but I, <laughs> I think I must have got, made the head of the department mad at me or burned too many bridges or something because I just didn't utilize them well, wait. as much as I, I probably could have. What do you mean, though? Well, because by by the time I hit my sixth or seventh year at the U, the head of the disabilities department was begging me just to, to get an associate's degree, which I had enough credits for, to get an associate's degree, um, to get a job. Her example was a greeter at Walmart and do community theater on the side because that's what I was passionate about and she said that in the room when it was me and her and my acting teacher who was 
uh, who's my academic advisor. And I remember my acting teacher and I locked eyes and I obviously I couldn't see the, you know, I couldn't see her eyes, couldn't see the expression on her face, but you could feel in the room that her and I weren't going to do that. Well, of course not. No, that's and, an insane. That's not yeah. accessibility. That's not helping you. Like that person is actively like you are paying so much money to be there, and that person is supposed to be serving you, and they're actively getting in the way of what you're trying to do. Like that's so well, and I not think, okay, right? And I don't think she was doing it to be because she hated well, me or to well, be no, mean. Well, no, I'm sure but, not. But like that's the it doesn't. I think it's the you know what what do they say? It's, um, the tr- impact over intent. Right, right. You know, well, like yeah, it. I mean, I had already, I had already borrowed. You know, at this point, I, I had already borrowed thousands of dollars. You know, to be there, and I just, it was getting harder and harder for me to care. Well, I had been, course. I had been at this for so long. It was you're just, a human being, and I was burnt out in the situation you were mm-hmm. in. There's no human on earth that wouldn't be burnt out, right? But at that, at that point, I was so close. I had right. basically completed almost all of the theater classes. Yeah. Uh, and I had completed all of my journalism classes to get my minor. Right. So this was like me at the end of school, yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. So at this point, it was one more theater class and like a, the rest of my general education, which I'd kind of sort of been avoiding to take all the theater classes. Right. So when when she left, I looked at my te- my acting teacher and I was like, you know, what? We, I can't stop. I'm so close. And she's mm-hmm. like, I know. I know you well, can't Well, that stop. also seems like if you got an associate's degree, that's not... You did all this work to get, like, an associate's a much degree worse is degree. Nothing. Like, that's, yeah. yeah, that's, like, what you... That's when you go into a university is when you already have your associate so you can get an actual degree. Like, that's not... <laughs> it's not a real degree. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no offense to those who have associate's degrees. Like, well, I don't have fine, any but... degree, so I'm, I'm speaking <laughs> of someone who doesn't have a degree, so it's not that I'm judging someone well, no, for it what was, degree they have. It, for, for me, it was bachelor's or bust, and if that took well, me yeah. 20 years then they, it well, was gonna take me 20 years. years okay six years for an associate's degree is the most offensive thing ever oh, i yeah. just can't well, imagine a yeah, more offensive because, situation because an associate's degree is only supposed to take you two years right exactly so, and like so you post and you have a bachelor's degree well because that's what i don't understand why the disability resource centers don't just like change the like the things to make it so that blind people actually get to get degrees when they've learned more than like all the sighted students in their major have like because we like have to learn much more than all the sighted students do and then we don't get a degree and we have to do like four more years of like bullshit unfortunately because that's not how the academic system works right but it's (laughs) like it's not i mean i don't think they should be considered disability resource center if they're not actually serving disabled people i mean they did they did a lot of work i they just I just didn't really click with them, so. But I don't I'm, know. I don't think that's. I don't think that's because of you, though. Well, no, I don't know. I also didn't come to them all of the time to get help with stuff. But do you feel like that's because you didn't like because you were just being lazy, or was it because you didn't think they were going to help in the way you genuinely needed? I'm. For me, I think it might be an issue of pride. I'm just stubborn, you know, and I. I'm also. I stubborn. can do. Yeah, and and I can do this thing. On my own, like you know, we're supposed to get. We're, I was supposed to get a letter for every teacher, every for every class that yeah, says, "Hi, I hate that you're stupid a, letter. You're a disabled student. You, it it is stupid, but sometimes it works. Um, well, no, it definitely worked, but it was just like, why can't? Why, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Well, yeah, no, no, but you know, my thing was like, well, I should just be able to tell them because I've had to tell everybody for my entire life, and I just started to not get the letters anymore because. When I was going through the theater department, our theater department is tiny, and everybody knew who I was. So yeah. if they had me in their class, they knew what they were in for. They they knew what was expected of them. So and a lot of my tests, because of what my major was, it, are performance based. So they're not you know pen and paper, well, those, A, B, and C right. tests. And those were the classes I always got good grades on in film school. And it was the same thing, as well. But then like. I didn't go to the Disability Resource Center a lot of the time just because they weren't going. I knew what accommodations they had available and they weren't going to do it. And I thought it was because I was stubborn and my pride for so long until I was like, wait a second. I didn't go because they weren't. I knew 
what services they offered. And I knew that those services from experience were not going to actually be helpful because so many times I tried to get a book and like I it would be week eight when I got the book and I found out at a certain point that if I just spent the like 20 hours it takes to just get all my books converted on my own, then I was actually going to get to start studying before the quarter was over, you know? And so like that's why I didn't go. But I really did for a long time think it was something wrong with me. And so that's why I'm like saying this because I'm like, wait a second. At a certain point, I was just like, it wasn't because I was being stubborn and didn't want help. It was because I knew the help was not going to help me. But I definitely blamed myself for a long time. So that's why I'm asked going down that line of questioning. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. And I suppose, I suppose, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of come, I've kind of come to the same conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> but after, after the, that conversation in my, in, in, with my ac- uh, academic advisor and the disabilities, the head, oh, I was done with them. Yeah. I, I don't know if I ever set foot in that office unless I absolutely had to yeah. uh, ever again. For, well, that's for like my self-care at that point. Like you're, you know, that's the only option you have to take care of yourself at that point. And yeah. it's not a good option and like, it should definitely not be the option you are forced to take. But it's like to not do that would be really harmful to your mental health and would not serve you in any way. You know, it's not like they were they were going to be helpful. I'm going to do this myself. And I did. Yeah. <laughs> Ta-da! I did it. I mean, it, it wasn't just me. I, I owe a lot to um, to my acting teacher and to all of the teachers that helped me along the way because I got loads and loads and loads and loads of second chances. I made a lot of mistakes and I got second chances. And I mean, that's pretty amazing. I guess I also made a lot of mistakes, but I don't know. I don't know. I imagine probably neither of us made that many mistakes that weren't based on not having access to anything. But yeah, it's, I mean, I, it was a very, yeah, I had a very bad experience. I am lucky that I gave up after four years and I know that a degree would be worthless. So I'm lucky that I just didn't bother getting the degree and, and meant I got to save myself from more years. And it, and honestly, the one nice thing about Bay Area prices is I was like, oh, I like cannot continue to pay rent. Like this is not an option. Like it's just truly I had to move away like it was not something that was going to be possible and I, so that I'm very thankful for because it allowed me to leave yeah I mean I hardcore bought into the idea that I need a college degree if I'm going to get anywhere in life and now I'm here in, now you in, know the in Portland and I'm like you know probably didn't have to do that in from from my line of work however I wouldn't trade the eight years I spent at college for the world yeah, I mean, I wouldn't trade the four years either. It was really, it was traumatizing in so many ways, but it's also like a very good experience in just dealing, figuring out who I was, and and also just doing a lot of just dumb shit, which I I think all people should have the opportunity to do dumb shit at the age of a college age, because that's if you don't get to do it, then you're always gonna be like that. The dumb shit will always be hovering above you, and you'll be like, you know then you'll do it later on when it's not a good time. It's like, it, you know, it's a good time to fuck up a lot. And the cool, th- one of the most cool things about college is people aren't assholes. <laughs> like, I'm sure you're going to meet your fair share of, of people who are jerks. Yeah. But people are really cool because you don't have to go through all of the the high school clicky social bullshit. Yeah. People in college are like, they're awesome. And there are so many clubs and there are so many people that you can find that you have the same interest as. Yeah. And that are just decent people. I mean, all of my lifelong friends that I've made that I keep for, for, well, for my life, duh, I made in college. Yeah. I don't contact anyone from high school and middle school. Yeah. Because what's the point? I weirdly don't. I, like, just have a handful of friends that, um, yeah, though I do still have probably about even of, like, close friends from either, but I also, I'm very bad at keeping in touch with people who are far away, so if they're not here, it's really difficult, um, for me to keep up those relationships, but, yeah, I mean, I am, I am also very thankful and I know that like 18 to 22 I wasn't going to be doing anything great with my time so if I was going to have a bad time I might as well have done it in like a very unique experience that you know you're not going to get the chance to do other times like and I went to a very beautiful school and it's a state school and I got to like make films in a cabin and you know there's a lot of good stuff and um yeah I I think that 
it's it's hard because it is like it, it there there's s- some affirmingness um and I think sometimes it's just comparatively because I think that college can be more more affirming in some ways I think for like people who don't have all the extra barriers because I think when you have so many barriers just to get the stuff that everyone around you is getting it always feels it's it, it, it always feels kind of inherently unaffirming <laughs> you know but then it's also like there is a lot of valuable affirming stuff that you get that like all college students get all college students get that blind people are not exempt from you know and so so it's a balance but um I mean, I'm also thankful at 22, my life got better and it's just going to continue to be better than anything before 22. And, and I'd much rather be in that direction. Like, you know, that's a much better life to like have your life get better at 22 and then, and then like just be better, like have a set point that's just better than everything that came before. Like to, to think about people who it's the opposite. It's that seems horrible. Like that, that would be a nightmare. (laughs) Oh yeah. I mean, if I hadn't have spent all that time in college I literally wouldn't be sitting across from you I would probably honestly I would probably still be living at home or living wherever wherever my parents were living right and I would be yeah and I'd be working at the visitor center which isn't bad I adored that job but but I don't I don't know if I can do that for the rest of my life yeah it's definitely I think in a lot of ways it gives you permission to leave and oh which is that's absolutely, the main yeah good thing which is absolutely what i needed yeah me too i needed to no, get the fuck out of, the, yes. out of the house yeah uh let's see last but not least we got Chaz, who dropped out right which we kind of talked about we that. did yeah. yeah so he uh, according to my internet research uh it is uh has a girlfriend and has a kid Chaz oh. Jr. and is still pursuing By soon after the movie too. Soon, very soon after the movie, yeah, and is still pursuing his uh, rap career. Yeah, as one uh, two C O N E, the number two S E E, and he put out music, uh, which coincided with the release of the documentary. Oh, did because the eyes of me is named after the that's, his song. Yes, that's where the title comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's one of the lyrics uh, in his songs about uh, being blind. Right. I think it's the title. It's one of the lyrics. I think it's also yeah. the title. Yeah, I think um, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of, and throughout the documentary, he's like writing the song. Like, I think it starts with him mm-hmm. talking about it and then it ends with him having finished it. So it's like the process of writing, which I, I really like that. It, it was very relatable of like um, in high school, like trying to like tell my own pers- Like I did a lot of like making films about other stuff and like finding a way to actually talk about my own experiences was the most challenging thing and so I really like that because I think that is a very true coming of age thing yeah it's really good to see these kids not only come of age and figure things out but it's also nice that this isn't just oh why me why me why am I blind yeah but but it's also not inspiration porn either no it's very realistic and the adults especially of like their parents are also very realistic yeah 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 not always the most helpful you know or like just (laughs) kind of you know Mm -hmm. middling i think do we see any supportive parents like that are in a very i think um megan's Megan's parents parents are are pretty supportive and denise's parents seem pretty supportive though they took her out of school they did take her out of school yeah i have i have a real bone to pick with with her parents yeah well they're very jesusy super jesusy yeah well and isaac's parents seem pretty nice um yeah though i'm trying to remember yeah but it is you definitely see like um yeah some of the 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 difference in how the kids are you know kind of thinking about their blindness and yeah I mean I think yeah some of them are are, are, are sweet and well-intentioned but some like some of them I think who was it who made more I think a bigger deal out of the blindness than the kid was I think it was Isaac's wasn't it like his grandparents maybe was that now I'm like not remembering exactly who it was maybe. but like I, don't... I think it I it was remember. a detached, detached retina. Who had the detached retina? Oh, that's Isaac. Yeah. That's yeah, Isaac. yeah. So I think it must yeah. have been his grandparents who were like... Oh, what, well, what infuriated... Well, because... Okay, I remember now. What infuriated me about that whole conversation was uh, they could have saved his sight, apparently. Wait, it had but to they do couldn't, with, like... Yeah. They couldn't afford it. Right, right, exactly. They couldn't afford to go to the hospital Which and that's do anything about it. Until stupid. his until his retina just finally, you know, detached. Right. 
Yeah, so which that's, I'm all for like being loving being blind, but the fact that this happens in our country is kind of that's it's extremely nother, problematic. But yes, <laughs> yeah, that's that is some crazy North Korea shit right there that you can't. I mean, it's just I mean, it's it's very American to like yeah. just you know become, but it is. But I mean, it is also like you know countries that don't have the resources we have. That is when then is where that kind of thing is more common. You know, like we have too many resources for. Like, it's just stupid that we can't figure stuff like that out. But, but yeah, so he's blind because of that, which, yeah, it is. I mean, it's also an interesting thing because I am always like, be proud of your blindness. But it, it, it feels silly when there was. Well, and that question did come up for me uh, as that story was being told. I, well, would he have had, a, you know, a better life or whatever? Right, right. It was Obviously, his life would have been different if he Definitely was sighted. Yeah. But... I don't necessarily think you can say or you can ask that question. You know, would his life would have been better? You know, would would he been would he have been more fulfilled to have sight? I think these kids' lives are are fulfilled definitely, and they're they're all blind. Yeah, and I think that like we talk about like um, not wanting to be blind in the terms of like someone who's been blind their entire life and like the idea of like mixing up ableism with like actually like dealing with ableism versus like actually what your eyes are um but yeah it does it it makes it more complicated when it's like it could have been a very short term thing that became going blind well, um, and, and another thing that's that's fairly interesting about these kids is they all uh were born with vision and then oh. slowly and then slowly lost their sight Though some of them wasn't it very early on, though. I believe so, yeah. Because yeah. they, and you actually do, like, own, it's halfway through the movie that they start, I think, even, like, anyone saying how, like, because they, you actually get to meet them for a while before they talk about really any details about their vision, I think, um, which is interesting. Um, the movie also, there's a lot of, like, um, very close-up shots where people are talking, but then I think they kind of, like, they do that at the very beginning, but then they kind of stop doing that it's in, it's weird <laughs> like it, it's like because they'll have like people will be talking and they'll have close-ups like mm-hmm. their face where it's like you know or like kind of like it's almost like the it looks like a blind person's filming it like it's kind of like that like just like a weird oh that feeling <laughs> yeah yeah i'm yeah, yeah. just like kind of pointing it towards someone talking well and i as far as them not stating hi my name is isaac and i'm this is how I was blind. Da, da, da. Right. That's not really, again, I think it just comes down to that's not really what the documentary is about. No, it's, no, I know. It's not I about think, how they got this way. It's about right. living and, them, their lives. Yeah, that's what I say because I think it was a, a very obvious, like a very intentional choice that they made to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but it is, I mean, and I think it also doesn't matter when, it matters more when you have to adapt to an environment that's cited. But it, it doesn't matter as much when you're not, when that expectation isn't on you because you can be more. They're living life with the same events that sighted people live their lives with. Yeah. You know, one of the, Chaz is going through poverty, which it just, oh my God, it, bra- it breaks my heart. Yeah, I mean, when he, it's really hard. when he was evicted, I'm just. Yeah, because he's evicted because he pays his half of the rent, but he's, but his, his roommate doesn't his, pay. Yeah, his roommate, half. his roommate doesn't And so through. it's, it is so upsetting because it's like literally he managed to get work like which is not easy and it's like it's just like you're getting punished for something when you're even like meeting the ridiculous expectations Mm -hmm. of a capitalist society Mm -hmm. but you're just not you know but the others around you aren't i mean my my biggest question was why the hell isn't he on disability benefits well he has a job so it might be that he couldn't oh that's true money from yeah And Texas might work different than other states. Yeah. But yeah, that honestly, that was my first thought. I was just like, what the hell? Like, what, isn't he getting anything, anything at all from from the government? Well, and I feel like, I mean, and he has a paycheck. And he was like so excited. He's like, I have a paycheck. It it's, it's, it's really heartbreaking because it's just like, I think that, you know, like we live in an extremely classist society where like people's money is seen, like it's seen like, like people make a choice like which pretty much never happens like you know no one's in poverty because they chose to be like it is always circumstances completely beyond someone's control and then we like make it seem like there's something wrong with anyone in that position but just like the amount that he worked 
to even yeah to meet those like expectations and and like it's it is heartbreaking because it's just like that feeling of like oh so even when you say okay I'm going to meet all the expectations on me I'm going to sacrifice what I want in the world just to make sure I meet these expectations and I'm you know do the right thing and like and then you know it's housing so it's such a basic thing that's just like taken away from him because of just you know something that he truly cannot control like there's just not even a question that he could control it and it's yeah it's 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 unbelievably heartbreaking <laughs> like, and he as far as we know he has a girlfriend and a kid now and works on and off at the lighthouse and is living with friends so well, that's good i mean at good. least he has at least they have a roof right over but their it's heads. probably closer to couch surfing though then again this was 10 years ago so yeah, it's we don't probably know. in a yeah. completely different yeah. situation now but <laughs> we um, we don't know yeah we should have called them all up to do this Be like what's oh, going on i know on, right guys? um but yeah i mean i think this has been a very um you know like kind of this episode we talked more about personal stuff but it makes sense because it's a documentary that is about the real lives of blind people and I think that that seems like it's easy, especially since it's something that we both could imagine. Like, you know, it's almost like a dream to even have the experience that they had. Um, but Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's just neat seeing all these different different experiences. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I do wonder, like, what would, would I be any different if I went to a blind school instead of, mm-hmm. you know, what I'm what I'm what I'm doing now and. Lord knows, there are definitely days when I'm like, yeah, I could use some of them adult life skills classes. <laughs> yeah. I don't have those. <laughs> I mean, we can sort of still, we can sort of still access them, but it's just like, I think like anything, there's always how much do you want to like give up your autonomy to the system and the system that's, you know, yeah, in our experience and, you know, in all blind people's experience, not going to necessarily be working for you all the time. You know, like there's many situations in which the system's not working for you. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, knowing when it's appropriate because sometimes it does and I think like this school is an example of when the system in, even though it's probably private school um, you know it is kind of like a you know a, a body that's like supposed to be helping blind people and it seems like it was something that you know I think all of the students other than Chaz not being able to graduate but that seems like it more had to do with like you know just general struggles that he had to go through that were not you know that really just were aside from school um like you i would think that the school would do more to address that situation though yeah well it, and that's it, it he just kind of fell away and it, i'm like where is the where's the support system right you know and the same you know the same with isaac yeah it's it's like the girls kind of sort of kind of sort of came out i don't well except for not even top, really but... just megan yeah, really. Because really all just of Megan. them kind of lost that support. And so I think that's that's also saying, like, this is not this is not a complete solution. And this is like, you know, you have to do you have to have a lot more uh, a lot bigger system working for disabled people because you can't just have like the little safe haven that like the second someone winds up like accidentally, you know, drifting out of that safe haven that they're complete, you know, they're completely fucked. Like that's not that does not serve people well. Like. Um, you know, the entire government needs to... Okay, I don't know why I'm getting very political in this podcast, <laughs> but I mean, you know, you need you need accountability of, like, how you're going to help disabled people, because we, you know, we have to deal with a lot more stuff, mm-hmm. and so we need to, like, have more support, and um, you know, and I think this could be one thing, and, and I also, like, I mean, one thing I think about is, like, in a way, school really prepared me for ableism, and, like, every day I'm just thankful that the amount of ableism I experience now is just like you know one thirtieth of what like I I experienced all the time in school and like having that as a formative experience really helped and I do wonder if like if you had a more accommodating school if dealing with ableism outside would feel 
more difficult because I like dealt with all that anger at how the world works and being upset like as I was growing up you know and as I was like in more low stakes situations in school and so having that experience maybe it would be better than if I like had to deal with all that fury like when I was like 25 you know yeah but that's that's just saying like I I deserve to be you know just put through the ringer and go through hell and then I'll just come out the other side a better person I I don't know. I I don't I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily see see things that way. I wish that Yeah, I there's I I wish that I could have gone to to a school like this. Yeah. Because I think I would have been <laughs> I would have been a better blind person. No, I but I would have been more adjusted to live in the world. Oh, interesting, cuz I feel like I would probably be much less. So that's interesting. Cuz I don't think they are, you know, model, modi call, modi coddling these kids right. at at the school, but they're learning how to how to exist in a world that isn't built for them. Instead yeah. of being put in a world that a isn't built for you and b refuses to adapt, yeah, for you at all, right? Though I guess I'm definitely an um, what's the right word um, experiential learner. <laughs> Like, I'm like, I'm not going to figure out how to do it unless I'm put through the ringer. And that could be a personality thing. I mean, and that's not just, and obviously no one deserves that. And obviously, ideally, the whole world would just be more accommodating. And that is the actual correct solution. And this is just like us trying to figure out what we want out of a completely broken system, you know. Um, But I do, I think for me, having those experiences, it, it made me feel like I have to speak up for myself, you know, and I have to... Um, you know, and I also, I can't, I think I also just have very, it's expectations of things play a big part in my life, I think, and they really affect my mood. And so if I'm able to like have lower expectations than what happens, that's, you know, that just helps my mental health so much. Whereas if my expectations are higher, that has a, then just for me, it has an unbelievably detrimental like effect on my mental health if I'm expecting things to be better than they are. And so I, I don't think that's true of everyone. So I think that might be part of where that need is coming from for me and that I, I, I would rather have my expectations as low as possible because then I'm going to be better at like adapting and figuring things out when I'm like, if I'm pleasantly surprised by things, it just helps my mental health. But yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. It might be a very personal thing, too. I think it is. And it's not just, like, all blind people. <laughs> oh, no. No, <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. We're, this totally depends on what your ex- what your life experiences is and where you grew up and who you grew up with. and you know, wh- Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it might be a personality thing, too. I mean, I wonder how much of that. I mean, I think that maybe you just wanted the metrics of how. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it, it's. It's a definitely an interesting thing to think about. I think for me, I would ideally want um, to be in a school with a mix of people that had more blind people and that also had community around that. Like you, you know, I just like I wish I just had like a like kind of how you'd have a church or something. Like I wish I yeah, had that yeah. with blind people. Well, and in most in most schools, the special needs department and the the visually impaired department. I mean, they are separate departments. And you when you learn, you learn separate from everybody. Right. So you are already cordoned off in this in this other group and it isn't about being integrated. And, yeah, and, and it, that's the problem yeah, that I yeah. would struggle with and a lot. It isn't about everybody learning. It's about it's about you. And I think if you went to a school with everybody learning that way, where no one where no one is separate, then you would mm, yeah, then maybe it would be it would be easier. Yeah, I think you know, just I think having a school that where you are making it a mission to accommodate the different needs of the different students. Um, and I mean, I, I it does take more work, and you know, not all schools, especially public schools, have proper funding. Um, and we don't make it a priority as much in this as in this country as other countries do um, that have better <laughs> education systems. Um, uh, so I think that that's you know all those factors go into why this doesn't happen. But you know I think ideally having a sense of community, but also being able to learn alongside people because you know 
you're going to work when you do get to work and get to do stuff in your life. It's not going to be all blind people. And having the blind, I think having a community of blind people is vital for your emotional health and like for support and feeling like you can do things and just like it is, I I think it is a deprivation when you don't allow students, like allow kids to have that. Um, But I think that at, on the same token, having the skills of figuring out how you can work alongside people with the, you know, getting the support that you need and also feeling like you're part of the broader community. I think you, I think both of those are really necessary. And so finding a way to have both of those things, because it shouldn't be a binary. You should just be able to do both, you know, like it should be that you have that community and you have spaces that are all blind people, but then you also have a, like a supportive school where you have a diversity of students and the and different accommodations are made for all sorts of different students you know and it's not just disability where people might need different things you know people coming from different home lives or you know who have different like money you know it's like how school lunches and stuff you know like you just need to take into consideration all this stuff in languages you know these are all barriers to learning um so yeah well, yeah i mean when I remember my mom's friend would have conversations with her and she was just convinced that I should go to a special school. It was the, that is that was the way that I should go. And my mom would get so angry and then in turn I would get angry too. You know, oh, how, you know, how dare you tell my kid they should go to a special school, you know, for people who are, for people who are like them. Right. And now thinking about it, I'm like, you know, <laughs> maybe that wouldn't have been such a <laughs> terrible thing. Uh <laughs> to go to a school with just blind people or a school that just was for the disabled. Right. I think there's a lot of value in having that option. Least, but then, yeah, I mean, at least there are places. There are places like the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. There are places like the Alaska Center for the Blind. There are disability services Yeah, in this country. And that's not a lot, but they're there. Yeah. They are there. <laughs> they, yes. <laughs> that's they, what I could say for there. them. They exist. They, they exist. Uh, yeah, they that's, exist. That's basically the main thing I can so, say for them. So <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that this, this movie is probably going to be one of our highest rated, I think. Yeah. Well, that brings us to our next thing. Mm-hmm. Good segue. So, so we have I tried really hard. <laughs> our blindness acuity test. Right. Which I never call it by the name. I thought it's a funny <laughs> um, So this is where we rate the movie from a scale of 20, and then it's something. So 2020 being um, a very sighted person movie, and then it's, even though there are blind people in it, it's completely from a sighted perspective. And 2200 being legal blindness. So um, if you are 2200, you are meeting the mark but then anything above is extra credit too because that's still i'm above 2200 so still blind people um but yeah so what what do you think your rating is oh wow i mean i honestly would go (laughs) i i i'm thinking 2400 nice (laughs) i because this the this documentary was not full of of other talking heads it was just these kids telling their story and we were just gl- we were just given a glimpse into their lives, and the documentarian didn't take sides. He didn't approach this with an agenda. Yeah, it was just the story that was being told about uh, blind kids and how their lives are. Yeah. So yeah, I I thought this was a, a really great, awesome documentary, and I'm sad that it took so long for me to see it. <laughs> well, that's why we have this podcast. Um, and I feel like mine is coming from very much um, a filmmaking perspective, which I feel like we both bring different perspectives into it. We usually give our ratings based on, um, yeah, different perspectives, which is why it's great. Um, but I actually feel like I would give it a 2180 maybe because I feel like it is close to like a pretty like spawn on thing I wish that the way it was I think the mix for me really was frustrating and the fact that the the voice over or the um audio descriptions are just so soft in the mix and like I think that 
it that to me is like kind of communicated that it was you know still there was still like a little bit of an a kind of removed observational thing of just having the sound being so problematic. I mean, I wonder I wonder if if it's just a bad stream or a bad transfer or something because yeah. I'm assuming we both watch this on Amazon. Um, um or on, I watch on Canopy. Oh, right. Okay, no, I didn't Oh my god, I forgot to check Canopy. I'm it's an idiot. Canopy, yeah. That's right. No, so I watched it through Amazon, but oh. I got a I got a free trial for this thing called IndieFlix, which I need to cancel now. Okay. Uh, but I I didn't have to pay anything for it. But okay, you, that's you good. You can I forgot it was on Canopy. You can watch it on yeah, Amazon. Yeah, so if you have though. a library card, you can watch it for free. Mm-hmm. So definitely do which that. Which is great. Yes. So okay, so maybe so obviously if you watched it on one thing and I watched it on the other, it's not the no, it's, it's not definitely the streaming not because it's, it's also the film. yeah, and, and like you said, it is baked in because I was like, is this baked in because it's so bad that I can't imagine it was a separate track and it is because like Canopy doesn't have a thing to turn on audio description so it's definitely baked in um and I I feel like it is you know um and and I don't it, it's hard to say exactly how much I'm sure part of it was just production value um and I the only thing that I think about with documentaries is just like they are not as often coming from the blind perspective like they don't like because they could be like I think it's like just like any other movie they could be made by blind people and so you're always having that um you know the way that you perceive it and this is so I'm giving it close to 2200 because it is mostly just a small nitpicky thing Um, I mean it's honestly in this in this docket it's not small like it is a glaring issue yeah if my my journalism teacher watched this he would say the same thing yeah the audio is not good the audio is bad and it does feel like when you have a a movie that is so much about just people who can't see and we don't have any deaf blind characters so it is just people who can't see who can hear just fine so like not having a good mix does make it feel alienating especially when you do have audio descriptions that are so buried in the mix that it's yeah that you wish that like that it, it doesn't feel accessible it just kind of reminds you of what could be accessible but then it's not yeah but and that's why I say it's coming purely from the filmmaking perspective because I do think as for the content I think this took very different blind experiences you know and having all the blind people and it brought up a lot of issues relating to blindness and like I think we've talked about you know we talk about this in a lot of episodes of like how if you would recommend it and that's like something that I think this is a good portrayal of the blind experience and it did feel like a lot of stuff is a good um like uh, I mean it is a documentary but it represents blindness in a way that that feels very helpful and like and you do have so many of the you know all the document um documents documentary subjects what is I don't know um they like all of the kids basically get to speak for themselves and get to tell their own story so it's in that way it feels very like blind positive so it's really a very nitpicky thing because I think it does <laughs> it does make the mark on on a lot in most of the content so no I would definitely recommend it uh, to a friend who wanted to know about blindness or to someone who is blind it's just really interesting and important to see the experiences of these kids yeah and it and it makes you think a lot about like you know your your own experience too and how because I think that like there is a so almost mythical way that like a blind school feels when you're a, when you're in a such a sighted environment in high school like it doesn't feel real so to get to kind of see a window into this like it 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 truly I don't know if you've had this experience but it does almost feel like a fantastical idea to oh, have yeah. like a blind school <laughs> well, you're you're basically you basically get to be a fly on the wall and no with no consequence yeah you can look in the window and watch and see what happens well, it also just feels like, I don't, did you have the experience of, like, the idea of an all-blind school just didn't even feel like a real thing? Like, it felt like a fantasy. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I think if I were younger, I would have thought of it more, definitely more as a fantasy. But now that I'm older, I'm just, I'm really used to the concept. Okay. So like, okay, well, so the fact that this school exists in Texas, great. Right, awesome. Right, you know, right. That, that's cool. I mean, there's a big school in Louisiana. There's a... There's the uh, NFB home base, which is in Baltimore. 
there's and you've got have yeah. you and I think maybe that comes from also maybe I think for me it comes from not having as much experience being in all blind space like it's very uncommon even in my adult life um so I think that's probably part of um yeah where that perspective for me comes from too um but yeah have you been to other schools yeah so I all uh, ACB uh which is Alaska Center for the Blind I was at a fair amount of time. I went to a summer camp, a few summer camps there. Right, uh, right. I never boarded there. It was they did have rooms. I never boarded there, and unfortunately, I don't know why, but I never took any classes there, and I regret it to this day. But so I've been to that one. I've been to the NFB headquarters in Baltimore, which is their blind center in Maryland, which was super cool because that literally is a place run by. A bunch of blind people. That's awesome. There are a few sighted people there, but most of the staff is blind. That's great. It yeah. is weird. It seems like that's so obvious to do that. It's so I know, right? weird how <laughs> uncommon it is. <laughs> those are those are the two big ones. I know that Oregon has something too. I think it's Oregon Council for the Blind. Oh, yeah, OCB. But I haven't really messed around with them at all. Mostly because they want uh, for me for them to help me. They want documentation. About Wait, my the commission? Yeah, commission. I'm, that's it. I commission. Hate yeah, I, them. I don't. Uh, yeah, it's even. It's a thousand dollars to get records, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? I'm the same eyes I've always had. No, exactly. And and they want they and they want, wouldn't uh, take the records of when I was diagnosed. Really? Okay, because yeah. they want for me for them to even consider helping me do anything. They want records they want an yeah. eye exam and i'm just I like i had to do that too and my parents were like you need to get another one and i was like no i don't and then afterwards when it was like yeah literally your eyes are the same as they're always gonna be nothing's changed like nothing's yeah. going to change there's no reason to be here but it's also a thousand dollars i was like okay well i'm never gonna do that again and but i did do it that one time so i get services at the commission for the blind and i can tell you not worth it don't do the thing really okay terrible good, services good to know good to know <laughs> Uh, but as far as like campuses, those are the only two I've I've been to. Uh, yeah. I got to go to the NFB convention in Dallas, but that was at a hotel, uh, so we didn't go to a, a their blind whatever their blind institution is. But it was really cool to be in a hotel with like ten thousand other blind people. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so I cool. that is amazing. That's so many. That was people. insane. That was one of the craziest weekends I've ever had. It was nice. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I I I don't even know. I feel like I would get too overwhelmed. I think I know myself and just the emotions because when I'm in that kind of situation, the first thing and the only thing I think about is like, I could have been doing this my entire life and I never had access. And I feel like now it's like kind of like Game of Thrones where at a certain point I was like, well, I haven't seen it up till now. So I've already wasted a bunch of my life of the, while the show was on that's not my whole life but oh, not yeah. knowing about it so the same thing with blindness i'm like i could have had this at a young age and it's hard not to think that that's a good analogy but <laughs> but yeah no i'm you can't miss what you didn't have so i have some I'm really because re- i'll figure out a way no i'm just kidding yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah i mean i have some i have some regrets you know seeing these kids go through doing what they're doing and and i'm like well i didn't get that yeah i want that and it's weird because they're also like close to my age like because it was you know back when i was in high school was when the movie Mm -hmm. came out so Mm -hmm. so that would have that would have been the same time i was in high school (laughs) i was four years into college there you go so you're less relating to the bit. time period but that's <laughs> a, a only bit, yeah. though can we just say this is the second movie where evanescence was oh part of it oh my god i laughed i laughed so hard i did too i was just like this is great <laughs> yep, so, yep, yep. i hope that i feel like we've done too many 2006 well okay no we did a couple 2006 movies so this is 2000 the early was when it released. Yeah, yeah we have a lot of like so we'll have to like diversify which actually brings us to and i don't know what the movie is so i'm and we might not be diversifying but <laughs> so melissa what is the movie that we are doing next next week we're watching the book of eli starring denzel washington and gary oldman and i've seen this once in college uh I think it was recommended to me by a friend. I can't, honestly, I can't even remember how I watched it. But it's been so long. I don't remember a lot of it. I do remember the twist, which I won't talk about here. But yeah, yeah no that's, uh, that's what we're watching next week The Book of Eli. I'm looking forward to it. What, you, what year did it come out? 
Let me look. Um, oh, I honestly, actually, I think this might be another 2010 movie. Of course. So there's going to be Evanescence in it. More than more Can than we likely. please try to just get any, just see how many times Evanescence can be in the movie? <laughs> oh, gosh. Wake me up inside. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay. You can uh, you can watch it on Hulu. Oh, hey. So it's Freezies. That's very cool. Hey, yeah. Oh, 2010. Hey, oh, we got it. I feel like it's like our age. We just have a certain time period in which yes. we're watching too many movies. It got a 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. So we're in, we're in for I'm a so treat. Excited. I'm, we are this in is for a, a great, treat. This is going to be a great contrast to this movie. I'm very excited. And I feel like... I'm I'm excited to laugh at something more than because I feel like this has been a really interesting conversation. I'm very glad yes. we had. No, you you. But it's much more emotionally draining. <laughs> you're really good at picking like the the really <laughs> studious, awesome academic movies, and I'm like, let's watch the Book of Eli. Girl. It's kind of more fun, honestly. I was like, I should be more like Melissa, just pick the ones. No, that are more no, fun. please keep picking these amazing, awesome movies because I definitely haven't seen them. And, uh, oh, oh, uh, Mila Kunis is also in this movie. <laughs> yes, I'm so excited. Okay, I'm very excited for this. This is, is going to be fun. And yeah, then, too, I feel like we do need to, like, decompress from, like, just we both have talked about very hard, difficult things to talk about. I'm just this is my suicide and online training coming out. I'm, like, figure out what our self-care is. What is your self-care for after we get up this podcast? <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, the, the first thing I'm going to do is eat food. <laughs> that, that's that's going to be that's the my, best kind of self-care. I made beef stew yesterday. <gasps> It did not turn out super awesome. I let it oh. I let it cook just a little too long. So it's it it looks a little bit more like mush than it does stew. But for mush it tastes pretty good. That's uh, good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make some rice and I'm gonna have some mush over rice. Nice. <laughs> Mostly because I don't wanna throw it away. I'm like I spent all this money on the vegetables and the meat and everything and I don't wanna I really don't want to waste it. It's not inedible. But it is that. But it's still self care, though. It's still self care. Yeah. So I'm Good. probably gonna do that, and then have like a I don't know, like a big old glass of milk or something. Nice to go with it. As a vegan, that sounds like something that. Is very good if you're not a vegan. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible <laughs> meal if you're a vegan. I'm going to eat beef and drink milk. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So but um, I love that. But what while I, oh, what, what is my self care? Yeah. Um, uh, that's a, I mean, I'm, I have a class tonight for make, writing dramedy. That's perfect. Script, that's so perfect self care. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. Um, and I haven't like done a lot of filmmaking stuff in a while. So, and I feel like this podcast has really made me think more about wanting to go back into it. Um, nice. so yeah, so it's Yay. really cool. So, um, um, let's see. Oh, so self care that, that was super fun. That might be what are that's a good segment our um, segment yeah are we talking about what's given us life yeah See? yes we yes. could we can actually do what's what's your self-care for after you get off this podcast could be the name of the i like it thing that we like that good. we're getting into good i like it <laughs> but yeah do you <laughs> want to um uh, i do you want to go first sure i've got i've got something yeah um, do mine it. mine is probably obvious since we talked about it prior to recording uh so besides the beef stew and the milk um what is giving me life this week was uh, uh, I did my first improvised TED talk last night with my uh, over Zoom with my improv group. We each made a, a weird slideshow and we each got to present everyone else's slideshow and then they presented ours. And I have never laughed so hard in such a long time. It felt so good. I mean, my face hurt afterwards. I had a headache because uh, I had been laughing so hard. Yeah. <laughs> It was so perfect. It was exactly what I needed. Aww. So I know that's that's not really something that everyone can access, but I mean, you just it, need a bunch of friends it's and fantastic. some PowerPoint slides. Yeah, yeah. It it was so great. It was so great. Oh, um, my thing is a podcast. Um, because I I realize I've only done one podcast so far, and I listen to a million podcasts, but it's a new podcast I've been listening to. Um, and it is called Permission to Speak. It is a podcast that is hosted by um, a dialectic coach in Hollywood, and she talks about how a lot about just kind of like from a feminist perspective of voice and and how not that women 
like it's not like want something about like oh vocal fry makes women <laughs> you know less you know it's it's definitely not um what's the right word like um uh, tr- s- blaming women basically it's like it's very much about like how sexism can change how people are heard and and how to help women have more confidence in their voice um but as someone who's now hosting two different podcasts it has been a really awesome thing to listen to and to hear about the different ways because it's something that I'm now thinking about all the time and especially editing podcasts that I'm in and it has just been a really awesome thing to get to listen to um and and hear about other because she also has um different like women in the public eye come on and talk about it um and it's it's just very fabulous and so that is called permission to speak it's hosted by Samara Bay, and um, and she's a very she's very awesome, and I'm really enjoying it. So that's a nice. great thing to, to listen to. Nice. Yeah, I've been listening to a whole lot of uh, RuPaul's Drag Race podcasts, <laughs> like recap <laughs> podcasts. There's the one I really got into is Race Chasers with uh, Alaska and Willem. It's awesome and it's super funny, and they're just goofy goofy wonderful queens nice. and it's it's it makes me happy so yeah that's awesome <laughs> the bonus one oh yeah. yeah bonus oh i have a bonus one too kesha has a new album it's really great listen to Ooh, it i haven't listened to it yet okay good because i adored her last album she's so. amazing i love her yes. so much i'm she's such a big fan cool. and i did not realize she had a new album and it came out in january and i was like how I, do i not know about this oh my god so okay, that's yeah. my other thing yeah but yeah excellent so we got, you got so, there's so many, so many things that we talked about. So now you have lots more things to check out. Um, well, thank you for listening, yeah, podcast thanks. listeners. Thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah. If you want to, if you love hanging out with us so much, you want to get in touch with us, um, you can tweet us at White Cane Pod. You can check us out on Instagram at Citizen White Cane. You can check out our Facebook, which is just Citizen White Cane. Um, and uh, you can also send us an email at citizenwhitecanepod at gmail.com and then another super cool thing that we want you to do is leave us a voice message which you can see find a link that's in the show notes um, to to send us that our way um, what what is your experience being a blind person? Did you, go, did you go to a blind school? Do you think that we shouldn't have them? What's your weird political beliefs that you can... I mean, maybe not that one, but yeah, if it's interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so that the link is in the show notes. And then also, lastly, of course, our awesome theme song was by Lucia Fasano. Thank you, Lucia. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. And, and have a t- t- blind blind week enjoy life i don't know there you go i like that enjoy life yeah that's good (laughs) see you next week see you next week bye